This is the Northern Ireland. Good morning, members. Uh, welcome to our meeting this morning, and I declare the meeting now open to the public online. I would like to welcome members who are participating by video conferencing this morning to maintain the social distancing requirements here in the room. And at this point, uh, Pam Cameron is on the video conferencing with us. Can I remind all members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? So um, there have been no apologies received. Are members aware of any apologies? No. So moving on then, members, to the uh, chairperson's business. Um, I suppose, first of all, just to note the successful committee motion that we brought to the Assembly Chamber. I think it was um, a good piece of work in terms of the Assembly formulating the motion, bringing that to the Assembly, and I think provided a very useful opportunity for members outside of the committee to discuss and debate the potential, um, the potential planning for the way ahead, how we can do things differently, how we can do things um, better, and, and utilising international best practice. Uh, implementing a proper find, test, trace, isolate and support system. So I think that was uh, very useful and I thank members for their diligence and their work around that issue. Um, so the, uh, the inquiry recommendations then we will this afternoon be going into an additional session to continue our work on the Care Homes inquiry and uh, members will look forward to members joining us there. Um, I'd like to welcome the fact that the neurology inquiry has now been transformed into, transferred into a public inquiry. I think members had indicated when we met with the inquiry uh, leadership team that that was something that we felt would be, would be useful, and I'd, I'd like to welcome the Minister's decision around that. I also welcome wh the, the, the decision to set up a, a fairly, a, to set up fairly rapidly a public inquiry into the urology. It's very worrying that there's an inquiry needed, that there's an, another inquiry needed into health-related matters here in the North. But, and, and my thoughts, and I'm sure all of our thoughts, are with everyone who's affected by that recall and by that inquiry. Both those are direct, directly imp impacted, and also family who are concerned. Um, and I suppose I would just, uh, just want to, to uh, send our best wishes to all of those and to uh, to say that it's, it's important that they are contact, communicated with early and often. Um, could, I, could I make a comment on that? Go ahead, Pat. Just, I mean, our job here as the committee is to scrutinise the Minister and to hold him to account when that's great. But it's also right that we should commend him when he, when he makes the right decision. <laughs> and, I mean, it was the right decision to elevate the neurology inquiry and the a statutory inquiry. And the minister also moved very swiftly to set up a public inquiry into the urology issue in, in, the, in the Southern Trust. So, I mean, I would like to commend the minister on, on, on his uh, decision to these cases. And also uh, the Mucklemore case. And I think it's clear that the minister clearly does listen to those people who have been adversely or negatively affected. Uh, in their interaction with uh, our health and social care service, uh, and uh, I, I want to thank the minister for that. I've spoken to some of the victims in the, in the neurology uh, recall, uh, and they're delighted at the minister's decision. So, um, yeah, and um, I also want to acknowledge today is Curers' Rights Day. Um, another issue that I think the committee has grave concerns around the support in place and indeed some of the rights that or the, the lack of rights more so in place for carers. Carers absolutely provide one of the bedrocks of the entire health and social care system here in the north. Um, they have been had been under huge pressure even in the run in to COVID nineteen and it has exacerbated they have been some of the the greatly the, the greatest impacted in relation to the withdrawal of services and I suppose we, we are keen as a committee that those services are reinstated and that supports are given to carers to assist them. Um, I did a meeting this week with a, the Coleraine branch of Diabetes UK and I have to say a very, very positive and uplifting meeting. Um, a range of people who have been impacted by diabetes. We are, we're all aware of the, the huge increase in terms of diabetes cases across the north. I thought the meeting was very positive in the sense that it was looking at solutions, looking at how things might move forward. And I'd like to welcome the, uh, thank the branch for inviting me to the meeting and thank the members for, for the uh, information that was shared. 
Uh, there have been, again, I just mentioned last week, but the, the letters from the Neve Louise charity, from, there's, there's letters there directly to the committee from young people who are struggling at the present time. Those are being circulated, and I would like to give members an opportunity to reflect on those at the next meeting. So if members want to take a look through the letters, if there's particular issues that you want to flag up or, or, or draw out from those letters, um, I think it will be useful for those young people to, uh, to, to have their voice heard and their concerns heard uh, in that way. So if members can have a look at that for next week. And then um, just to flag that myself and the Deputy Chair Pam Cameron attended a briefing on common frameworks here in the Assembly this week. Um, I think there are a number of issues around these common frameworks of concern, um, including engagement with stakeholders here, how these frameworks will interact in the future with, uh, with the protocol, how that may be impacted by the, 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 uh, the British legislation, which is, is, is uh, in, the, in the ether as well. So I think those common frameworks are going to be a huge part of the work for the committee in the, in the weeks and months ahead. And, and I think the, the, the briefing was very welcome and very useful, I have to say. I found it very, very informative. But there are concerns there around the, the impact of Brexit in delivery of health in particular, as well as across the wider society and economy. So, thank you for that. Moving on then, members, to the draft minutes there. I refer you to the minutes of the meeting held on the 19th of November, which are tab 3.1 of your meeting pack. So, are members content with those minutes? Yeah, members are content. Members, there is one matter arising then. There's one item under that, and I refer you to tab 4.1. A member of the committee has a, proposed that the committee write to the First and Deputy First Minister to ask that the matter of a mutual agreement between Britain and the European Union covering medicines, medical devices and other health care products be raised in ongoing discussions with both parties. Do members have any comments in relation to the letter? Have, no. No, I, I, I had no issues either. The only, the only thing I did think would be a useful addition to the letter was where it states where it states that uh, in in the in the penultimate paragraph there it states uh, let me get the start of the sentence medical devices and other healthcare products that avoids unnecessary duplication of regulatory work and allows continued supplies of products into the north including from Britain with minimal disruption. I think it will be useful to add there from Britain and the European Union with minimal disruption. Yeah. Would members be content with that? Okay, thank you. Um, so members are content. Um, yeah, that's that okay. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on then, and I see we have been joined now by uh, further uh, members from the department. So members, we're moving on now to our departmental briefing budget. And I refer you to tab five of your pack there. I can advise members that departmental officials are here today via video conferencing to update the committee on budget matters. So I'd now like to welcome by video link um, Ms. Bridget Worth, who is Director of Finance. Mr. David Morning, Keenan. Yeah. Morning, Bridget. Mr. David Keenan, Head of Financial Planning. Are you there, David? Yes, good morning. Morning, Chair. Morning. Mr. Andrew Dawson, Workforce Policy Directorate. Are you there with us, Andrew? Morning, yes. Um, and just to say, I'm actually uh, from Investment Directorate, Workforce Policy, with my previous stamping ground. So I'm here on behalf of Investment Directorate today. OK, thank you. And Ms. Kira Dolan, do we have Kira, Director of Transformation, on the line? Yes, yes, here, Chair. OK, thank you. And. Okay, um, so thank you for coming to the committee this morning, everyone. Um, appreciate your time, and would you please go ahead now and brief the committee? Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I I'm delighted to finally be making my first appearance before the committee as the department's finance director, and I'll start by taking you through the resource position as set out in the paper. I'll then hand over to Andrew, and he'll take you through the capital position, and after that, we'll be happy to take questions. Um, as you've seen, Kira is on hand, as usual, to assist with any queries um, you, that you might have um, that relate specifically to transformation, and Dave is here to assist me generally with the detail on the resource side. Okay. So, starting off with the resource position, 
Um, I think it's important, first of all, to make a few general remarks about the context within which the figures in front of you have been compiled. Um, this information was largely put together in September, when we were only just beginning to understand how the second surge of COVID-19 might impact on our health services, and when there was much less certainty around the discovery of an effective vaccine. Nevertheless, um, the main assumption underpinning most of the information we've provided is that there will be a degree of normality in the operation of the health service in the next financial year. You'll appreciate that it's probably too soon for us to know to what extent this assumption is correct. And therefore, the level of accuracy of the information presented must be more heavily caveated than would usually be the case. As highlighted in the paper, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the health and social care system was already under mounting pressure. The costs associated with maintaining existing models of service were increasing at a pace which could not be sustained within the budget available. These issues have been compounded by COVID-19. It's therefore likely that even if we are able to maintain um, return to some semblance of normality, the additional costs associated with managing the impact of the virus will continue to be considerable in 2021-22 and potentially beyond, which means the department will again be facing a significant funding gap in future years. Whilst the paper sets out indicative figures for 22-23 and 23-24 alongside our projections for 21-22, the committee will now be aware that we are looking at a single year budget and I'll therefore be focusing my remarks on the 21-22 position. The budget which health and social care receives the next budget period will be crucial. Table one in your paper sets out the estimated total forecast expenditure of nearly 7 billion required to maintain our existing services and deliver on our NDNA priorities. The paper then goes on to discuss the savings position. Whilst the downturn in mainstream activities in the current financial year has meant that costs have reduced, you will appreciate that, again, assuming a return to normality next year, these will not be replicated on an ongoing basis without having an impact on service delivery that we would not want to see. At the same time, the need to, deliver, deal, to deal with COVID-19 has impaired trust's abilities to deliver the sorts of recurrent savings we would expect to see. Uh, and this is recognised in the position we've put forward to DOF, where we are proposing that no additional savings are asked of trusts and that the current savings target is reduced by 30 million. This will still represent a challenging position for trusts who had been looking to hit a target of some 123.3 million that was previously delivered non-recurrently. The next section of the paper then sets out the potential income generation measures that were submitted to DOF as part of the budget process. This provides the potential policy options available to raise additional revenue to offset rising costs. Importantly, it's recognised that these policy decisions would require executive support before they could be taken forward, and they will also require time to be implemented, and hence any income generated may not materialise in 2122. Turning next to the additional funding requirement, the department is currently anticipating a significant funding gap as the current £6.1 billion recurrent budget baseline will not fully meet the forecast costs of maintaining existing services. The total additional resource funding requirement 2021-22 is estimated at around £868.8 .8 million. Further detail of the breakdown of this gap is provided in Table 2 and in the rest of the paper, which provides additional information on each of the pre pressures outlined. But in summary, the 868 million comprises 93.1 million provided non-recurrently in 2020-21, 30 million pounds of a reduction in trust savings targets, 48.7 million of additional funding required to continue services to the whole of 2021-22 that were delivered for a part year in 2021. That's what we refer to as the full year effect. Um, 319.9 million pounds of new and inescapable pressures and there's more detail on those in table three. 240 million to address the impact of COVID-19 and 157.1 million to address NDNA priorities, including additional transformation activities, um, and those uh, broken down further in Table 4. These um, additional requirements then are offset by an expected 20 million of pharmaceutical savings under the MORE programme. We're continuing to review and refine the funding requirement in advance of being advised of the Department's budget outcome. 
Obviously, early indications from yesterday's spending review indicate that this will present us with significant challenges. In addition, the significant and unprecedented uncertainty faced against the backdrop of COVID-19 makes service planning challenging and will represent a significant constraint to financial planning. Even now, we're only looking over a one-year horizon. So that concludes my briefing on the resource position, and I'll hand you over to Andrew to have uh, speak about the capital position. Okay, thanks, Bridget. Um, and and uh, so this is in relation to the, the capital position, and the briefing paper at Appendix B um, is in line with the assessment of our, uh, and when I say our, the Department of Health's funding requirements for the period 2021-22 to 2024-25. Um, paragraphs one to outline the purpose of our briefing uh, in the paper uh, and uh, the, our approach taken to develop the four-year draft capital program uh, for the period 21 to 25 and the issues we face without additional capital investment. And the paper also notes um, that now in the, in the circumstances of a, of a further one-year budget settlement that will continue to limit our ability to commence projects uh, that continue beyond that financial year. Uh, included in our budget response to DOF are details of our flagship projects, followed by, by what we consider to be our contractual and inescapable priorities, city deals, and then high priority bids. Uh, and information has also been provided on estimated capital receipts for the next four years. It should be noted uh, that the information in this paper is the Department of Health's assessment of the capital position, the Department of Finance. Uh, we'll have the final say on classification as to as to whether a project is, for example, inescapable. Uh, and indeed, um, the Department of Finance forwarded its summary findings to us yesterday afternoon, and we're now working through that assessment. Uh, paragraphs three and four of the of the of Appendix B outline the aims of the DOH capital program, um, and again notes that importantly, our ability to track transform uh, and rebuild uh, our health and social care services directly linked to the level of capital resource available. Uh, over the last number of years, our capital needs have been considerably in excess of our budget uh, allocations, uh, and we've had to constrain our, our programme to match budget availability, uh, and there's nothing to suggest uh, that that will be, be uh, any different in the future. Paragraph 5 and 6 detail our flagship and committed projects currently in delivery, including flagship Mother and Children's Hospital uh, and the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service Learning and Development Centre. We also continue to progress key developments in two acute hospitals, the Ulster and Alt McElvin, the CT scanner at Craig Avon and the replacement children's homes at Glen Mona are currently in design. Uh, and whilst the contracts for these projects have not reached the main construction stage, it's our assessment that that uh, to discontinue those ones now would mean that those essential facilities would not be able to function. Other projects deemed as committed, uh, which have recently received approval or are due to receive approval in the next few months, are the new mental health facility in the Northern Trust area, which is being taken forward to design stage one. The low voltage electricity works at the Craig Avon Area Hospital, the new uh, Lissinski Health Centre, and the radio pharmacy facility at the Royal Victoria Hospital. Paragraph 7 outlines the, the, the ICT projects that are in the Department of Health view critical. Uh, um, uh, that just, uh, and we regard these as inescapable. Uh, they're critical to the continuity of service and functioning of the HSC. Uh, paragraph 8, 8 to 15 outlines some detail about those bids that, whilst not, uh, in our view, fully contractually committed, um, they are required each year, just as we say, to keep the lights on. Um, and again, we ask, uh, I suppose, readers to note that the cost to maintain a hospital is higher than any other public sector building. Uh, we also, again, have the responsibility to replace expensive medical equipment and to maintain uh, fleet and estate, um, not just for hospitals, but for example, for the fire and rescue service and the ambulance service too. Standout figure in that section of Appendix B is our assessment that we've an estimated backlog maintenance liability in excess of one. 2 billion, according to our State of the State Report 2019. Um, the rate at which facilities could be replaced uh, or uh, repaired within the existing envelope is already starting to manifest itself in service delivery issues. Uh, and improving this is again likely to be challenging against the backdrop of managing our other capital investment priorities. 
paragraph 1620, um, again, I then outline that we have um, undertaken a, a capital planning review exercise to the period 2029-30 with our arms length bodies uh, with the aim of, of producing a suggested uh, draft future capital program. We are current, that has not been published yet, uh, but we are currently updating the draft to, to take account of uh, change of circumstances owing to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and resulting need to uh, rebuild the HSC. Table one on um, page 19 summarizes the capital requirements as submitted to DOF in our um, information gathering exercise over the next four years. It also includes new proposals brought by brought forward by our arms length bodies um, across all service areas. Um, due to the critical need to rebuild the HSC, the proposals include potential funding for urgent and emergency care centres, the day procedure units at Lagan Valley and Musgrave Park, and a further rollout of multidisciplinary teams in GP practices. For mental health, we've in, in, included a line in relation to the new facility and the Southeastern Trust to bring that to design stage one, and a six bed perinatal mental health unit has been included from 2023 24 uh, for planning purposes. Table one shows the Department of Health's assessment that funding of at least 345 million is required to fund what we consider to be our flagship contractual and inescapable priorities in 2021 22 and onwards. Uh, and an allocation below this figure would have a significant impact on our ability to bring forward the critical new projects outlined above. It's also clear that our capital budget needs to increase in future years to meet the details of existing commitments and critical new projects. Finally, it's important, uh, again, just to reiterate that this paper details the Department of Health's assessment. As I said, it's the Department of Finance that decides the classification of projects and whether they are, in its view, inescapable. Um, and uh, we're working through uh, the Department of Finance's assessment, which had forwarded to us yesterday afternoon. Um, so that's just a, a very brief run through of the capital paper. Okay, thank you. So are there any further briefings, Bridget, or is that the, the briefings concluded in that sense? No, that's, that's the briefings concluded, Chair. Happy to take questions. Okay, thank you both for that. Um, I, I will start with Andrew, maybe, first in relation to the capital. And you stated, stated there, Andrew, that, uh, that the backlog is starting to manifest itself in service delivery issues. Can you elaborate on what, that, what those delivery issues are and how badly they're impacting or manifesting? Well, again, yeah, so, um, backlog maintenance is, is essentially the, the, the growing list of things that need to be done um, to improve the estate or maintain the estate. Um, so again, it, it's a it's a vast list. There has been a, a there's an ongoing um, assessment of, of the property needs right across the trust. Um, and again, probably um, the the, the one point two billion figure uh, is a twenty nineteen figure. So it probably likely that will increase whenever that new assessment has been completed um, in the first part of next year. But I mean, you're, you're, it's, it's, it's everything. So it's, it's the fact that some buildings aren't big enough for use. It's the fact that the material of some buildings needs to be repaired, um, and therefore, if, if something's not big enough, then the service can't be expanded. Um, or if it's, if, if it's in a reasonably poor state of repair, then uh, it can't be used maybe for the purpose for which it's intended. So uh, it's, it's a very sort of general. Um, there's no one specific thing. It's, it's quite a lot of things that you would expect just in in a, in a, in, a um, in an estate the size of the one that we're working with in the health and social care sector and the fire and rescue service too. But are there are there ways or are there assessments being conducted of the real rather than a more notional impact? The real impact on frontline services and and potentially I suppose the impact further impact on waiting lists is is really worth. Where it comes, where the where the rubber meets the road in that sense. So, is there an assessment ongoing Absolutely. in a more specific way, Andrew? So, the the, the, pro, there's a, the property assessment uh, program is is what we're doing at the moment, and yes, that that does look at the the impact of on, on services, etc. I'm not sure where it goes into exactly links to waiting lists and things, but it certainly does look at the impact on services. 
Um, and again, I think that it will be telling. Uh, it will be interesting in a future committee when we bring the findings of that to you, um, exactly what the, the impacts are. Um, but yes, th those assessments are done as part of the property uh, assessment. So yes, when the rubber does hit the road, as you say, uh, we we do we we will know the link between them, um, the, the the effect of the estate uh, on service delivery. Yeah, because I suppose it's it's crucial to all concerned that 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 the 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 key concerns are flagged and dealt with as quickly as possible before it becomes more of an issue. Staying on that subject, okay. um, I note that the backlog is 1.2 billion on an estate that's worth a total of three billion. So almost a half of the estate is. Is I suppose um, under some sort of pressure, either in terms of size or maintenance or usability. So that's that's obviously a huge concern. Within within your briefing that you've supplied to us, it states that uh, the, ser the serious backlog is there due to underfunding. The paper then places risk management responsibility with chief executives. So if a chief executive was forced to close a facility due to safety concerns and breaching the commissioning plan that they have in place. How would the department approach, or the board indeed, approach that that issue? Again, I suppose we have early warning systems in place so that if something is impacting on the ground in a certain facility that a chief executive or a member of an executive board does bring to the department's attention, uh, there would be uh, scope and time to try and address that. Um, but yes, you, you're right. I mean, this this is probably it's it's a struggle for the ALBs themselves um, on an ongoing basis because it's it's it's, it's essentially a firefighting um, exercise, uh, and it's I suppose a struggle for us as well. When, whenever something is brought to our attention, that we do try and cut our cloth to to try and uh, um, address that. But it, it's, it is I probably would say done on a piecemeal um, basis at the moment. We probably need a more strategic approach. Um, to that, but again, that's impa that's impacted and informed by the amount of money we have available at the beginning of any year. Yeah, I think yeah, I think it's certainly I think a strategic view of this because it obviously presents a significant risk to services. So I think a, a strategic approach to it would be would be essential. Final one on the resource then on the capital. Sorry, Andrew is in relation to in paragraph six there, page thirty six. There's a uh, there's a reference to. Other projects which, which have been taken forward to design stage one. So there's the low voltage works at Craigavon Area Hospital, the new health centre at Lisness Gay, and the radio pharmacy facility at the Royal Victoria. Can you tell me how the department oversees those projects to ensure they're being delivered? So you've allocated money, you've assessed they need money, they're key projects. How do you then uh, ensure delivery through the design? And build and commission stage to get it up and running, and ensure that deadlines are being sort of first of all set in a way that are achievable, and then and then reached and 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 uh, managed. How does the department oversee that process? Sure. Uh, so just that paragraph six, just to clarify or just to, to re reiterate. Uh, it's it's the new mental health facility in the Northern Trust, which has been taken to for to design stage one. Uh, and the, the, the other uh, um, projects mentioned in paragraph six um, are, are, due, are, are due to receive approval or just have recently received approval. Okay. In terms of how we oversee that, uh, we have um, a very close relationship with uh, our central project director in, um, in, the, in the Department of Finance. Um, and it's that body which uh, essentially, uh, it does the project management for all of the uh, ongoing health projects. Uh, those are professionals um, in, in the construction industry, um, surveyors and architects and, and, and colleagues like that. So they have the specialist project management um, ability. Um, my job and the job of the investment director then is to to oversee all of the work that's both going on in terms of trust projects or uh, in terms of uh, flagship uh, regional projects um, and work with CPD in the Department of Finance and the trusts uh, just to, to tie everything together. It's the department that then will have to go off and, and get more money if more money is needed at a certain point in the project. But we are very much informed by our professional colleagues in the Department of Finance, CPD, Health Projects Unit. 
But do you track progress in the sense of holding someone on delivery to account for the, the various stages? Is that we do? We have a number of um, accountability um, uh, um, means of, of doing that. So uh, one thing is that I hold the, the department holds uh, regular bi-monthly um, strategic investment group meetings with uh, each of our trusts, at which CPD are also uh, included. Uh, we monitor. Um, all projects very very carefully indeed um, and there there is the accountability you know the, the accountability starts I suppose even before the business case is signed off because the department uh, in the form of our program management unit and our economists uh, runs the rule over draft business cases just to make sure that everything stacks up um, in the in, in the, uh, the, the the business case case process even before funds are committed uh, and that accountability is maintained throughout uh, the, the, the project uh, process. Okay, thank you Andrew and um, I'm going to go back then to Bridget I think for my next my next question in relation to uh, Bridget. In April you advised us that 50 million was required to meet NDNA commitments on clearing the elective cure backlog. Can you explain why the NDNA section of the present document indicates costings of 30 million over three years? Okay. Um, so, Chair, that um, assessment has been revised in the light of the COVID-19 situation. Um, our original forecast of 50 million back in April was based on being able to access capacity in other jurisdictions um, across the water in. Um, the rest of the UK and and potentially um, in the Republic as well. Um, the revised estimates recognise that in the light of COVID-19, there will be a limited ability for us to access those that's that sort of excess capacity because it's likely that um, the rest of the UK, for example, has its own backlogs that they will be um, attempting to address um, next year. And so that's why we then ramp up slowly um, beyond next year, um, hoping that some of that capacity would become available to us again. There is um, an extra 20 million for elective care included elsewhere in our budget bids um, on top of what we would have currently been spending in recognition of the fact that there will be a need to, to you know, assuming the funding is made available to us, that we would be planning to increase elective care next year. But um, as I say, I think we we accept that um, by not asking for the money, we 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 won't be able to deliver the NDNA priority next year. But um, realistically, if we um, get the extra twenty million that we've asked for elsewhere, that will probably be all that's deliverable. And. I suppose, I suppose our, our concern would be that um, given our, our, our waiting lists are so bad as, as it sits, any, any uh, delay in terms of getting that. So, and we all recognise the difficulties that COVID-19, I have to say, is, is creating. But have other strategies been looked at or other ways to increase capacity to enable the money to be spent being looked at rather than just stretching out the, the spend? Um, so, as I say, when we when we did our assessment, we 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 looked at what we thought might be deliverable, and that is reflected in the additional twenty million that that's in in the other sections of the of the budget um, ask, I suppose. But um, that, and as I say, that at the time that we made this assessment was what we felt was deliverable. Um, Obviously, we will continue to look for any other options that could become available to us to deliver more capacity. And um, you know, should the money then be made available to us, we we will we will obviously spend as much as we can to try to address the the, the, the very troubling issue of, of the rising waiting lists. Yeah, and, and I and I do accept I do accept there what you're saying that that you have assessed what's possible. What I'm saying is, has there been more? energy and imagination put into what's achievable with you know outside of the outside of the current realities how you could uh, how you could drive up that potential you know with with additional recruitment outside of you know out, out around the world or rather than making an, a, a cold assessment of what's possible deciding what's what's desirable and trying to work to achieve that within within like is there other are there other things being considered Alongside, alongside this reality. 
And I suppose I, I don't have any further detail on that available to me at the moment, but certainly, you know, I can take that back to colleagues and, um, you know, make the point that the committee would like to see us make sure that we have explored all avenues possible. Yeah. Yeah, I think the approach would be, what do we need to do and how do we do it, rather than simply what, what can we do? You know, it, it, we need to look, look forward in, in, and ahead in that sense. It does say later on in the uh, Bridget, you reference an estimate of 750 million to 1 billion to deal with elective care. Can you elaborate on that for us, please? So, I mean, even the 50 million that we'd put forward in April um, was recognized as being constrained by what we thought would be possible to deliver in, a, in any given time frame. The 752 1 billion is the total amount that we, we had assessed at that time that would be required to clear the, the full extent of, of the backlog on, on waiting lists. So even the 50 million um, was already being constrained by what we thought was possible to be delivered in, in, in the, time, the time period. Um, so you know, the, the, the task is, is, is immense, and I take your point, um, and I think it's a very, point very well made that, that we need to be doing everything that we can um, and thinking innovatively about, about the extent and pushing the envelope on that scope. But um, as I say, the, the figures there are a, a recognition that the full 750 to billion um, is not deliverable in a, in a, in a very short period of time. Okay, thank you, Bridget. I'm going to go now to members there, and I have, first of all, Paula. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation this morning. Um, my question was around, first question was around the severe deprivation funding um, confidence and supply commitment, and there's 1.7 million on that. Can you outline what that will be spent on and whether there's any collaborative work with the Department for Communities when you think of the, the link then into poverty? Thank you. Okay, um, so that 1.7 million um, was on the ground in the current financial year in 2020-21, in um, and it will continue to be spent. Um, I mean, assuming we receive it, we would continue to spend it in, in the same way. I don't actually have detail with me today on exactly what that spending is, is, is on, I'm afraid. Well, well can, we, can we get that, please? Um, I can certainly, if, if the committee would like to write, we can, we can certainly um, um, provide an answer, yes. Thank you. Um, the second question is in relation to the 140 million, which has been indicated for the purchase and administration of a vaccine. Uh, I'm just wondering, is, is that, um, first of all, how, how is that money going to be spent? Is that going to be additional funding given to our GPs or pharmacists to actually administer? Um, the vaccine, um, and also whether there, what sort of collaboration is there with across the four nations in terms of the UK government orchestrating the purchase of the vaccine? Okay, so um, as explained in my opening remarks, that figure was a figure that we had put in in, in September um, when we weren't, you know, we, we, we're fortunately moved on um, a long way in terms of where we're likely to be with the vaccine. So that 140 million included the cost of purchase of a vaccine. So my latest information is that um, the UK is, uh, is likely to be making the purchase of the vaccine on, on a um, UK wide basis and that that won't, that that charge will not be passed on to Northern Ireland. Now we, we obviously um, still have to get final confirmation of that as, as, as things move forward. So we're not um, expecting to need um, the same level of funding um, that I've set out here. However, um, we will, as you point out, there will need to be money made available to GPs and to um, other partners potentially um, in terms of making sure that the, the money is there in order to deploy the vaccine. Um, and our current estimation of the likely cost of that is around about 50 million in total. Um, that would be to administer two doses of the vaccine to every member of the population of Northern Ireland. So. Um, you know, that's probably a high side estimate um, because it would assume 100 per cent uptake of the vaccine. Thank you. And just a quick follow up then. Would that 50 million then include the public health messaging? So at the moment, it's a very, very high level estimate. Um, 
so it, uh, based on the agreement of the money across the water um, to pay GPs to administer the vaccine, but we have added some additional um, contingency in there for things like transportation and, and so that there probably is some um, scope in there for, for the public health messaging, but certainly, in um, you know, we will want um, the vaccine to be as successful as it can be. And um, I would be surprised if funding would be a, a constraint on that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So I'm going across then on the phone to Colin McGrath, who has joined it. Colin, are you there for a question, please? Yes, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to the panel for the presentation. Maybe just first a uh, note of something that I've seen in the presentation, and that's that the Southeastern Trust has capital bids in for facilities in Lisbon at the Latin Valley uh, and for the mental health facility beside the um, Ulster Hospital and, and nothing for the Down. Once again, uh, the Southeastern Trust is ignoring the Downpatrick area, but I will pursue that with the Minister. Um, could I ask this question? It's maybe my reading of it, and I'm always noted as not being great with figures, so it's a, a finance question. It talks about the shortfall for the next three years. Is the projected shortfall in year three that from the budget one and a half billion? Um, yes. Yeah, so um, in twenty three twenty four um, in table two, um, the funding shortfall is one point six billion. Right. That is. How does that compare to, to previous years? Is that something that monitoring rounds will kind of filter and sort and, and a bit of jigging around as you go forward? But what 1.6 seems a massive hole in a budget to be to be sort of planning for. So I suppose the first thing to recognise there is that we are comparing. That's a that's a gap on the 2020-21 position. Um, so I suppose it's a three-year gap as such rather than a single-year gap. So I suppose we would hope by the time we got to 22-23, our baseline, you know, our recurrent baseline would be higher and therefore the gap between 22-23 and 23-24 would be smaller. Um, I mean, the, we, we find, I suppose, every year in health that our ask um, and what we would like to do, and I suppose it's the same in any, every department, the scope of our ambition is not normally matched by our funding allocations. And so we then have to look through what, what we would like to do and um, prioritise where we think the money um, can best be spent. Um, and, and I fully expect to have to do that um, when we get our budget settlement. Okay. I think maybe we'll, we'll work with you in monitoring that, but that obviously is something that we don't want to see come to light to have a, a one and a half billion shortfall, because even if it was a, a quarter of that, there would be a substantial number of cuts that would be taking place. And finally, my second question then is that you, in the inescapable pressures, you've included pay uh, in that. Does that include any pay rise for our healthcare staff? I know we're all very supportive of them and the wonderful work that they do, and we want to see them getting uh, some form of pay increase. Does does that pay? Uh, it, it says inescapable pay pressures. Does that include any form of pay rise for our health service staff? Yes, it does. So that would include, um, it, in fact, primarily includes pay increases for um, nurses, doctors. Um, Dentists, pharmaceutical staff, departmental staff, fire and rescue staff, uh, are, are pay rises for uh, assumed levels of pay rise are included in that figure, yes. What, what is that assumption? Is that a 1% pay rise? Uh, bear with me a second and I will tell you. Um, David, actually, do you have that figure readily to hand? It, it's a 2% pay rise. Okay. Okay. Based on a 2% pay rise in line with the Department of Health and Social Care in England. Okay, well, I yeah, hope that comes to that, uh, at least because given the announcement by the Chancellor yesterday of a pay freeze, I think staff here would like to see um, a pay rise and it is something within our control. But, Chair, thank you very much indeed. That's me complete. Okay, thank you, Colin. And going now to Jonathan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. I think we all appreciate the huge pressures on the health budget at the moment. Uh, I suppose probably some commentary in terms of um, concern probably regarding the projected tripling of escapable costs 
uh, from 21 to 22 to 23 to 24 does cause a lot of concern, given that around 900 million is also earmarked for transformation uh, without any real focus on elective waiting lists. I suppose also I would just like to put on a note of caution regarding some of the moves suggested within your briefing about means of generating income uh, highlighted. These are you know, we have to realise that these are serious and substantive and would require executive and industry engagement before taking forward. I suppose my questions uh, are the detail the briefing details a range of new capital projects that the department would like to take forward, including increasing bed and ICU capacity. Given the Minister's insistence during COVID that capacity cannot be increased without more staff, what is being done to ensure that there are synergies between what is in the resource and capital budget, and are the 900 nurses and midwives included in the forecast enough to address the workforce requirements? Um, okay, maybe I'll um, comment a little bit on, on the revenue side, um, and Andrew can perhaps then come in on the capital side. Um, so I suppose just to reassure you, the costs for the extra 900 nursing and midwifery students are in here. There are also significant um, costs within the um, uh, new, new inescapable pressures um, to um, take account of the need for um, training that we're already committed to and um, other um, increases in training. There's also funding in there in terms of international recruitment of nurses. So um, I think at this stage, um, we have reflected funding for, for what um, colleagues in workforce policy um, believe um, is, I suppose, necessary and importantly also deliverable next year um, in terms of um, additional training for staff and 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 as I say additional recruitment of staff um, from outside Northern Ireland um, in terms of, of marrying that up with the capital program I mean uh, I'll, I'll maybe ask Andrew to comment on that but um, uh, in terms of um, perhaps some of the links with backlog maintenance, Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think you're right. The, it's all very well, I suppose, having the shiny new buildings, but those are, are only as good as the ability to staff them. Um, and that is that is absolutely critical. Um, there, there are, I suppose, whenever whenever a new building is being developed, there, there is a, a degree of workforce planning that goes on in terms of what the staffing uh, requirement is and what, uh, what the full complement would need to be and what we have available to us in the system. Uh, in, in, inevitably, I suppose there are always pressures um, between those two numbers um, and therefore always pressure on the system. Um, that's why I suppose there has been the focus in, in the last two to three years, I think, of increasing the number of training posts um, in nursing and midwifery, uh, in medical specialties, etc. But again, that's I'm, I'm sort of speaking on my old brief now rather than my, my current one. Uh, but yes, there, there, there are links between um, what what we plan for in terms of capital. Uh, for example, this, what, whatever the size of a, a building needs to be, um, it, there is a direct link between that and the number of people who need to be involved in delivering care on that site. I know, um, I'm but sorry. then it's a matter. Sorry to, to cut across, but I, I know the 900 nurses and midwives are in the forecast, but my question is, is it enough to meet workforce requirements? given that that has been the highlighted issue throughout the COVID period. Uh, but, and it's a probably a lead up to that. Is this an ambitious uh, budget forecast or is it a case of playing it safe while we see the fallout from COVID-19? Because why are we not seeing any saving targets for the next three years with interest? And can, can officials actually explain where the 120 million plus of savings will come from? Okay, so, um to take the first part of that question maybe first um we do recognize the challenges that trusts have faced this year in terms of covid19 and i suppose our we we recognize that the delivery of saving takes time and um we've effectively lost a year in terms of savings delivery because of covid um and the the I suppose less ambitious savings targets um, over the next three years recognises that. 
um, when I talk about the 123 million coming forward, um, effectively those are savings that we had asked the trust to deliver over the last couple of years that they have yet to be able to implement recurrently. I mean, you'll appreciate we've, we've a £6 billion pound budget at the moment. Um, the purpose, really, of those saving targets to trust is to recognise that we expect that there will be efficiencies to be found within that. We're not expecting those savings to be made through cuts to services. We are expecting them to be made through um, low-impact um, measures um, through greater efficiency for example, through um, procurement savings, through better ways of working, things like that. We're not expecting that to be cut, but we have to be realistic. We are coming out of a pandemic and our ability to do the work that is required in order to deliver those sorts of sa savings has been and will continue to be severely limited as we deal with the pandemic this year and deal with the impacts of it in the future. Okay, no, I appreciate that, that comment because I think given the scale of spending within the department and we, we recognise the need for that, there could never be enough money for health, frankly, but with six billion, uh, there, there needs to be an accountable mechanism within the trust and within the overall system to ensure that money is spent and spent well. I think that there is a, a widespread concern among the general public that while we're seeing continuous money allocated towards health and towards specific trusts in particular, but the efficiency savings aren't there and there is money that's being spent and spent unwisely. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go to Alan now and then I will be going to Pam Cameron on the phone to just to flag that. So I'm coming to Alan. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, Bridget, just on the uh, page 24, we talk about the potential income uh, generation opportunities and I know that in the, the following paragraph you, you say that, uh, that the amount of, of income that could be generated is, is dependent on the, on the charging regime, so I understand that, but could you maybe give me a sense of, in terms of reintroduction of pres uh, prescription charges and additional charges for dental services, could you maybe give me a sense of the sort of range of uh, income that, that, that could be available? Are we talking tens of millions or what sort of figures? So in terms of, of the prescription charges, um, colleagues have estimated that there is a potential to, um, to um, generate around £20 million um, from the reintroduction of prescription charges. Now, that would be a net figure in that wouldn't necessarily be the amount of money you would raise from prescription charges because the reintroduction of charges brings with it um, underlying additional costs. So what they're saying is they think we could generate an additional 20 million over and above the cost of um, administering a prescription charge. Um, in terms of the dental, um, again, and, and as you rightly recognize, it depends on what measures would be um, exactly what chargings were in introduced. In terms of the dental measures, I think we're looking at a total of around about um, 7 million across the range of potential um, changes that are outlined there. Um, the, I suppose there's two main areas that, that, that we've looked at in terms of dental charging. One would be to increase the amount that people who already pay for dental services pay. So that would be effectively, you know, if you already pay for dental services, you're currently charged at 80%. So we'd be, that would be one, one means of raising additional revenue would be to charge a higher rate to people who already pay. And then another way of, of um, raising income would be to charge some people who don't currently pay. So to look at changing the criteria around the um, what qualifies you for free dental treatment. So there's, there's I suppose there's a, there's a range of things that could be done in the dental space that would would um, generate additional income. Uh, Bridget, in terms of uh, you know looking at the. Uh the budget that you would have set for 2021 uh, back, say, last April, and, and looking at it today, I'm sure there are two completely different uh, pieces of work uh, with all that has happened in, in the last sort of uh, nine months. But uh, in terms of setting your revenue budget for uh, uh, next year, 
uh, have you sort of, have you anticipated, you're working on the basis that there still will be uh, perhaps unexpected COVID um, costs coming in, things that you can't even at this stage anticipate, or are you basing your revenue budget for the next financial year on some degree of uh, normality? So the, the vast majority of the numbers are based on there being some degree of normality, and I suppose um, the, the, our ability to spend what we're asking for here um, in terms of the mainstream um, funding and, and indeed um, transformation funding and, and NDNA priorities would depend on there being a degree of normality. Um, COVID does severely restrict our ability to deliver um, uh, mainstream services, or certainly it has in, in the current um, financial year. Um, where we're recognizing the potential ongoing challenges of COVID is the extra 240 million that's included there for COVID. Um, I already talked about the 140 million for vaccine in, in response to Paula's question earlier. Um, that there is another 100 million in there, which really um, is, is very non specific and deliberately non specific because we don't know what those challenges might be. Um, in detail at the moment, we have a, a, an idea of the sorts of things we wanted to do this year to rebuild health services that we haven't been able to progress as far as we would have liked. Um, and we've an idea of some of the responses to COVID that depending on the rollout of the vaccine may or may not be needed. So really that 100 million is there in recognition of the need to continue to respond to COVID. But um, even it probably assumes a degree of returning to normality because for example, um, this year um, we were expecting to spend 250 million on PPE alone. So obviously, if we're still in full COVID response mode, 100 million will not be enough. Thank you. OK, thank you. So I'm going then on the video conferencing to Pam Cameron. Pam, are you there? Hi, Chair, thank you. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we're hearing you. Clear, Pam, thank you. That's super. Um, thank you to the panel for your attendance today. And we don't underestimate the um, incredible challenges with budgets every year, um, let alone in a pandemic. So um, I, I want to ask you um, around um, the key flag, flagship capital projects like the Mother and Baby Hospital, uh, because I really believe that that needs to continue to progress, especially in light of the impact um, the pandemic will have on mental well-being moving forward. And it's really important that there is a pathway to funding um, the additional three mental health units as soon as possible as well. One of which has already been mentioned um, is to be um, created uh, within my patch here at the Andromeda Hospital. Um, could you tell me what the timetable is for opening of the mother baby hospital if these budget requirements are met? And I wanted to also ask you, given that no additional capital allocations are expected next year, when do officials believe construction of the three mental health units can begin? Thanks. Thank you, Pam. Okay, thanks for the question. Um, in relation then to the Mother and Children's Hospital, the current position um, is that the, uh, there is a process within the, the um, procurement um, process called the pre-qualification questionnaire process, which essentially sets out a series of questions for tenderers in terms of, or potential tenderers in terms of their experience, capacity, financial standing, etc. That has recently completed. Uh, so, um, and then work is con continuing in relation to the tendering. The trust is looking at the uh, enabling uh, packages of, of works that need to be done and existing planning permission as well. Um, there is a requirement to demolish one building on the, the site, Bostock House, which, as I understand it, um, not only is a building, but there are um, there there are pipes and, and supplies running through it that need to be taken care of in terms of new um, works before that building can be demolished. But I, 
I understand that the demolition of that Bostock House site is probably a major milestone in getting this uh, done. And then um, there, there's a, there is a slight risk, I understand, that in terms of planning permission lapsing um, prior to the, that work being done. So we're trying to put a, a bit of an acceleration on that so that the planning permission remains current. As I understand it, then the Children's Hospital is now expected to complete mid-2026. Um, and uh, we're also, uh, importantly, continuing work uh, to look at the lessons learned from other major projects outside uh, Northern Ireland, because uh, we're aware, of course, that those uh, will have a lot of lessons for us uh, in relation to, the, to that particular project. In relation, then, to the mental health um, facilities, um, and sort of just first of all, turning to the to the one in the uh, Northern Trust area. Um, sorry, let's turn it up here. Um, so approval was given for that one in August 2020, uh, and the preferred option is a standalone permanent mental health inpatient facility on the Abram area hospital site. That would include 134 beds, comprising 80 acute. 12 psychiatric um, intensive care units, 20 dementia beds, 12 rehabilitation and 10 addiction beds. The total capital investment cost is seven oh, of the Antrim area site is uh, just shy of 80 million, including inflation, uh, but not including the optimism bias. Um, so the anticipated schedule from approval um, is, is about 25 months to to the um, to completion. Um, so we're looking at what, um, maybe tw late 2022 by my count there, in terms of that. Um, however, um, due to the budget, the current budgeting situation, that, that's obviously a risk to everything that we're doing at the moment because um, we're having to facilitate it in stages. So I should probably walk back what I just said. It's not going to be 2022. It's going to be 25 months subject to budget, really. Um, so sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to, to go too far there, uh, but 25 months over a period of project and budget and phasing and so on. Thank you. Pam, anything further there? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's grand. Thank you. Just a, a further question then on um, whether uh, the EU exit or the NI protocol had any impact on the inescapable costs over the next years and why is there a, a rising year near cost for drugs and therapies? Okay, um, so in terms of the drugs and therapies costs, um, the there is a rising cost there um, due partly to the fact that we expect that there will be more people who will need um, Though, uh, the drugs and therapies, it also recognises that, you know, obviously they, there is ongoing discovery of new um, drugs and therapies that can be more um, more effective in the treatment of existing conditions. So, um, the, the, obviously, we would want funding to be available there to take to enable our patients to take advantage of any new developments in that area. Um, it also includes additional costs for um, staffing and other resources to support um, increased levels of demand, um, such as, you know, um, pharmacists, um, infusion nurses, um, and support staff, obviously, in terms of the administration of, of those um, <laughs> treatments. Um, at the moment, it's very difficult, I suppose, to predict the extent to which um, EU exit will have an impact on the cost of those drugs and therapies, and um, I can't um, provide significant assurance that, that those figures um, include any increases in that respect at the moment. That's obviously something we'll need to keep under review um, as we see whether there is um, experience of, of increased costs uh, as a result of, of, of EU exit. Um, um, but as I say, that that I, I, we haven't specifically factored that in to those figures at this time. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pam. Okay, coming back now into the chamber here to Orlea. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
Yeah, so just staying on the, the topic of mental health, um, I know that the Minister did um, in the June monitoring round and in October um, there was a couple of million um, pound of bids that were submitted um, and I, I know the detail of those. Um, but I did meet with him on the 18th of November and I mean the Minister actually does accept himself that the mental health, the spend from the, the, the budget in, in mental health is still only 5 to 6 per cent, which is £300 million a year and still significantly lower than the spend in Britain and in the south of Ireland. Um, so I just wanted to ask, but there is some positives um, within, within the briefing, um, but one thing that was missing, I, I had spoke with Naomi Long two weeks ago around mental health and she was talking about the see the pilot project that's being run in the Musgrave um, the Musgrave custody suites um, so it's a pilot project around custody health care and I know that the PSNI I think that um, they have put 1.5 million towards it to continue on with it but Naomi Long was saying that um, sh there, there's financial challenges from the Department of Health um, which would obviously need to, you know, part fund the project because it's not just a justice issue, it's a healthcare issue as well. So I'm just wondering if I've missed that or if it's contained anywhere within the bids within the Department of Health budget. Um, that's the first question. The second one is I'm delighted to see mention of, I know it's only six beds and it's, you're aiming for 2023-2024, but the six-bedded um, perinatal mental health unit that's the first that I've seen that on paper, and again, it was something I spoke to the minister about last week. Um, but that's the first that I've seen it in, in black and white. So I'm really, really glad to see that. Um, I know it's still, a, it's, it's still, a, um, it's you know, still a good bit of time to wait on it being implemented. But I'm just wondering, would that six bed unit be contained within the South Eastern Health and Social Care Trust unit? Um, I know it was referenced just in the same part of that briefing, so I'm just wondering around the location. Um, and then just finally, uh, it was also mentioned in the briefing around 5.6 million um, for the Mental Health Capacity Act. And I was just wondering if someone could provide a wee bit more detail of the breakdown of what that 5.6 million pound means for the implementation of the Act. Thanks very much. Okay, I'll start then maybe by talking about the first thing you mentioned, which was around the um, healthcare in the prison service, I believe, the custody, um, uh, PSNI, sorry, rather than prison service. Um, and I'll maybe see, I don't know, David, if we have anything on the final part of the question, but I'll maybe ask Andrew to come in in the middle part in between and, and give David a bit of time to see what we have. If we don't have anything on that, we can obviously provide you with some, um, you know, if you, uh, we can provide it in writing. Um, in terms of the um, question around the PSNI provision then, um, we recognise when we were putting this budget together that um, the timeframes didn't allow us really, I suppose, to get into the detail of all of the inescapable pressures that the department might face next year. So within our new inescapable pressures, there's, um, I suppose, a bit of a catch-all line called further inescapable pressures of 52.8 million. Um, and that's in recognition that there will be things that we haven't detailed separately that we need to work through with our colleagues across the department just in terms of understanding um, exactly what else there is. I suppose it's, it's, it's a number that recognises that there, there are a number or there'll be a range of pressures that we didn't have detail of at the time we made this submission. Um, so I suppose that's not giving you the reassurance that it's definitely in there, but it is saying, saying that, that we have put in additional money in recognition that there is more work to do here for us in, in refining all of the department's pressures. Um, I, I, that perhaps doesn't fully answer your question, but I suppose it's, it's, it's the answer I have at the moment. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I, didn't, I, I could come here if that is helpful, Bridget. That would be helpful, Kira. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, just, uh, um, just as an assurance that um, the, the custody suites within Musgrave is a project that has been supported through transformation. And um, at the moment, I'll, I'll just have to double check, but I think that that 
caused for next year may be included within the 95 million of it that's capable so I'll, I'll come back to you on that but there is a process of evaluation going on at the moment um, between the department and led by the led by the board look at all of these projects that we have commissioned over the last sort of I suppose in 2018 to see the impact that they have made um, on the aims that they set out to achieve in terms of transformation um, with a view to you making recommendations for a regional commissioning next year and um, all depend on money but you know where that service will have a positive evaluation it would be my um, intention to recommend to, to, to the um, to the regional management board and to the minister that that's something that we should continue if indeed um, it's met its objective. So it's definitely still in a free aim in terms of something that we would like to be taken forward next year if, it, if it's proven successful. Thank you, Kira and Bridget. And just on the, the location of the six bedded um, inpatient perinatal unit and the 5.6 million breakdown of the Mental Health Capacity Act, that may be something that, that again you can provide in writing if you if don't have it with you today. Uh, I can come in there on the perinatal uh, mental health unit. So uh, it, the location has not has not, not been determined um, at this stage. Um, that that is still to be determined. So there has been um, no decision made in relation to location. But I think we did feel it was important to uh, put that marker down in the four-year information gathering exercise. Um, our estimate for. Um, of, of the cost of that is, is a total of four million uh, pounds, and we've provisionally put in just for mo for illustrative modelling purposes two million in 2023-24, and the the balance of that the further two million in 2024-25. Um, but obviously still subject to budget um, and uh, and funding and so on. But um, we, we we do recognise that that it's it's a hugely hugely important. To, to progress that one. Okay. Just on that break uh, mental capacity. David, I don't know if we have the breakdown, do we? Um, no, sorry, we don't have a breakdown of that 5.6 million. That is a continuation of services that are already on the ground, but I, I don't have actually a breakdown of what actually makes it up. It's in our basically full year equivalent. So it yeah. is at the minute, so we'll have to come back and write on that. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Arlea. Uh, and going to Jerry there. Thanks, thanks for the presentation. Uh, just following up on the 123.3 million uh, savings, it seems insane to me. We're talking about any savings in the health service in the middle of a, a global health pandemic. Um, but if I can kind of hone in on it, um, is it correct or uh, has there been 51.3 million savings this year and 72 million uh, next year? Is that the figure? So, um, just bear with me a minute. The 123.3 million is basically the remaining amount from the previous two years that hasn't been um, delivered recurrently as yet. Um, so, I think that the savings figures for the past two years in total, I think, was 72 million and 77 million. I'm looking at David to see if he's going to nod at me at that point. Um, at which okay. of which 123.1 uh, the, the 123 million is the amount that Delays hasn't happen. yet been yep. delivered recurrently and just so i'm clear um how does that work i know you were bridget you were saying about um you're expected to be procurement issues or words of that effect does the department give a um, stipulation of trust that they have to save x amount or x percentages and it's on the the onus is on the trust to implement them or how does that process work so the department will um, engage with the Health and Social Care Board around the total amount of savings that um, it expects trust to deliver and then the Health and Social Care Board will work with the individual trusts as to how that target, I suppose, is, is um, split between trusts. And then, as you say, yes, it is then up to trusts to bring forward proposals to the Health and Social Care Board of how those um, savings will be delivered. Um, and the uh, Health and Social Care Board will then have scrutiny of of the plans. Yeah, okay, thanks. I mean, I appreciate your comments about procurement, and obviously if things can be uh, gotten, you know, the same kind of levels of care and services and medicines in a cheaper way, obviously that's good, but my concern is that uh, this is these figures are often result in, in staff reductions or, um, 
voluntary exits or, or, or anything like that, so I'm quite concerned generally. Just finally on, on the staffing issue, um, I know Jonathan kind of touched upon it, but has there been any specific work around uh, ICU capacity? Because obviously we've seen the, the shortage and um, the issues in ICU nursing in particular, so I would be um, keen to know, I'm sure others would be as well. Is any work being done to try and commission or to develop or increase ICU uh, capacity in nurses in particular? Okay, um, Andrew, maybe you can comment on the capital side. Um, in terms of the revenue side, um, we have a lot of uh, a significant number of additional training places envisaged through the funding asks that we've got here. And um, there are regular um, reviews uh, from our workforce policy colleagues on what the best mix of um, I suppose the the types of um, nurses and 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 doctors and um, other um, healthcare workers that we need. Um, so in commissioning those training places, those sorts of factors will be taken into account. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and uh, Pat. Uh, thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks for your presentations this morning. Uh, uh, Bridget, I apologise, I may have missed this earlier on, but did you give out a figure for? How much funding went to the PHA for their contact tracing operation? I didn't, and I'm not sure I have it with me, to be honest with you, right. um, in terms of this year. Um, it's one of the things that we had said, obviously, would potentially need to be con continue to be funded into 21-22, but we haven't attempted to put a figure on it um, specifically. It's, it's in that sort of general 100 million. And I don't think I have the figure on the 2020-2021 uh, costs with me today. Okay, fair enough. Um, I, I, I'm just wondering if the PHA has made any request for additional funding to expand their test and trace operation. Are you, are you aware of that? Yeah. So in terms of the current year, in terms of 2020-21, um, yes, we continue to engage with the PHA to ensure that within our um, allocations that we've been given this year for COVID-19, that there is sufficient funding for what they need in terms of the test, track and trace. Yeah, I, I, I'm just wondering, I, I don't know if you saw the Spotlight programme the other night. It was effectively a comparative study between the contact tracing operations here and in Wales, uh, and, and Wales for a population of 3.1 million uh, is uh, going to recruit 3,100 contact tracers, one contact tracer for every thousand of the population. Here we have about 150, 160 full-time equivalents. We can't get a precise answer from the PHA about full-time equivalents. They seem to have some difficulty providing that figure. But if we benchmarked and imitated the Welsh model, we would be talking about 1,800 contact tracers here. And, and that's why I'm asking if the uh, PHA has made any additional requests for funding, because that would be a significant increase. That would be, you know, that would be the PHA being a bit more ambitious than they have been thus far. And as I say, I, I am aware that they have made um, some requests for increased funding. Um, I don't have the exact details with me at the moment. Um, but uh, as I say, we, we, def we are working with them to, to ensure that we provide them with the funding that they need. And just finally, could, could you give me those figures, the figures uh, for the year to date and any uh, additional requests? We can certainly follow that up in writing. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to check back with the panel there. Were, were, was Andrew going to come in in relation to Jerry's question on the capital issue of ICU provision? I might have cut across you maybe and didn't give you the opportunity. Andrew, were you going to come in on that? No. It's fine. Uh, again, I was just looking through my uh, uh, the, the, the budget, the information gathering return there. Um, there's nothing specific that's jumping out in relation to ICU, but that's not to say there's nothing in there in detail. So if it'd be possible just to to uh, follow up maybe in writing on that one as well. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you. And uh, there's a number of there's a number of issues there that are a number of things that you've agreed to forward, and, and appreciate that. Just just a final wee question that occurs to me in on the back of the question around income streams and dentistry and that. And um, I suppose there is a concern in relation to our current situation here with dentistry, which which is already fairly dire, I have to say. Um, we have the, the number one reason for admission for children to hospital here is for teeth extractions. Uh, there was 23,000 teeth extracted from 5,000 children in 2018. And my question in relation to the budget is, do you go back and have a look at previous um, spending decisions or, or revenue decisions as to what the impact of those decisions were on health outcomes? Do, does that equation, does that circle ever get closed in terms of looking back and then informing future decision making? Okay, um, I, I don't have a specific answer to that question, but in general, um, Whenever we implement a change um, in the way that we do things, we would expect there to be a post-project evaluation that would um, assess the effectiveness of what we've done in terms of the expected outcomes and um, to you know, assess whether there had been unintended outcomes and, and, and really to make a conclusion then on, on how um, well or otherwise um, the, 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 the um, intervention has performed. And does that apply then on future budget decisions? Does that... so, so I suppose um, in advance of making the decision we would expect that there would be a business case um, that would set out the various options to achieve the desired outcome and the um, potential impacts of those and that there would also be appropriate um, assessments in terms of things like um, equality impact, um, rural needs impact and, and, and that sort of thing. We would expect that that would be undertaken in advance of making any decision and yes, if there are lessons to be learned from similar decisions, we would expect those to be considered at business case stage. Yeah, because we've already we've already a, a strategy that's 14 years out of date on dentistry. Some of the worst outcomes across these islands and large parts of dentistry already privatised. So it would be troubling if we're if we're thinking of that as a revenue generating. We need to look at the health. We need to actually undo some of the inequalities in terms of health. Going very quickly to Jonathan. First. Thank you, Chair. You raised a point there about looking back at previous years uh, and are they reflective and and where we are now? And I just I just wanted to ask the question. Obviously, there's been serious increases in, in budget allocations for COVID spend in particular within our trusts. What accountability is there that that money is being spent in, in relation to uh, COVID concerns within hospitals? Because obviously there will be some trusts that will see uh, the ability of extra spend to use for other transformation within their trusts or whether it's rebuild processes or purposes. Is there an accountability in that and is that factored in in, in the figures that we're seeing today? Okay, to take the general point about accountability on this year's COVID money, um, every um, proposed spend is subject to um, a, an evaluation process. Now, it's an abbreviated evaluation process, obviously, um, ex uh, given the speed with which we've needed to um, act in some cases, but it is proportionate, a proportionate evaluation of how we're spending that money. Um, and that process obviously is scrutinised at the moment. That is being um, scrutinised at Deputy Secretary or Permanent Secretary level, uh, in, and obviously in some cases um, by the Minister, um, where those decisions um, obviously require ministerial approval. Um, so th that obviously gives us the opportunity to check that those proposals are um, appropriately targeted towards addressing COVID issues. I would say, though, that um, you know, one of the things that COVID funding is designed to address is the rebuilding of the health service as a result of COVID, and so naturally, um, there will be um, quite a large bleed between 
um, what something that could be regarded as transformational will often also address um, specific COVID issues as well. So I suppose that the, there is probably legitimately um, a situation where some things that might previously have been regarded um, with a transformation badge or with a rebuilding badge are being regarded this year as, as COVID related because they are addressing COVID issues. Um, I think that probably covers most of what you'd asked. No, it has. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, and listen, thank you to, to all of our panel there today for your presentations, for your answers uh, to members' questions, and your commitment uh, indication that you can forward additional information on to us. Um, thank you very much for that. We look forward to speaking to you again in due course, I'm sure, but to just wish you all the best in the, in the days and weeks ahead. Uh, Al Moore, August Slam, thank you very much for that. Good luck. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members. Thank you. So um, there's a number of pieces of information there just to to do a, a, ones that I had picked up on were detail on the spend around the mental health facilities that Pam had raised. There was the impact on services in terms of the maintenance budget, potential impact on services and, and patient safety. Uh, information on the custody suites that Arlea had flagged up uh, and the breakdown of the 5.6 million spend and the contact tracing operation then that we're looking for the detail in relation to that um uh, chair there was also the severe deprivation funding did you say that yeah and i'm sure you know, clark has probably captured some others so listen i think that that's that's useful for now and we'll look forward we can take a look at those further pieces of information yeah ju just in relation to a point that pat sheehan raised uh, i think it's worth further consideration by the committee in relation to the PHA bids for track and trace, because continually we're told in the chamber that there is an attempt and effort to scale this up. And when you compare it to other regions, it's, it's, it's not stacking up. So I, I think this committee needs to further probe, not just wait for figures to come back, and, and I'm open to, to Pat Sheehan suggesting on this, but certainly in liaison again with the PHA as to see what is being done. Because the decisions being made, whether people agree or not, or don't agree regarding lockdown, the potential for track and trace is a solution to try and allow businesses to coexist with this virus, and it's not being taken up, in my view, seriously. Yeah, and I, I think I think I would agree that that there is certainly certainly huge potential to at least mitigate some of the lockdowns and put a more sustainable footing in place, not only in terms of COVID-19 and this particular wave for the surge of it, but also the ability and the learning for future and potentially future pandemics. So I think we do really need the, the places who have done a lot better have done a lot more of that type of thing. So would it maybe be then as, as well as asking the department to provide the figure to ask the PHA to provide us with Absolutely. an update of what, what monies they're bidding for and what their yeah. actual plans are at present? Chair, could I? Uh, I'll go to our Leah first, and then no, come back. Just no, Pat's looking in. That's oh, okay, Pat. Uh, I couldn't okay. agree more with Jonathan on that point. I mean, anyone who watched the Spotlight program the other night, I'm sure, would be astounded at the differences between what's happening here and in Wales. Uh, you know, they make phone calls in Wales. Uh, they phone you when you're supposed to be in isolation. If you don't answer the phone, they go and knock your door to see if you need support. So. It's not just that the, the contact tracing traces people, it provides an element of support and helps in terms of compliance and, I suppose, to, uh, to another degree, enforcement as well. So uh, that just goes to show you in that short programme the other night, you got a, a flavour of the effect a proper contact tracing operation could have in terms of allowing us to carry on, by and large, as normal, the economy to carry on society to be relatively uh, open and, and if we can trace the people who have the virus and isolate them then everyone else can carry on by and large as normal. Uh, so I, I, I agree with that proposal Jonathan put forward. Yeah, and it also, it also strikes me in the context of mass testing, hopefully being, being ramped up and that's very welcome, hugely welcome, I have to say, and I acknowledge the hard work that's been done on, on that and, and look forward to the delivery of it. But there's not the least bit of point in testing anyone right. if you don't ask them to isolate. And there's no point in asking them to isolate if you don't provide them with the support to allow them to do that. So the entire system has to form a chain. So I'm going to go to Jerry, then Alan. 
Okay, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I would agree with the proposal. I didn't see the programme, Pat, but I've seen the headlines. It's quite worrying. But something's not adding up because we're having a, you know, according to whatever figure the PHA gives us, a very low level of tracers. But the minister is kind of saying, effectively, he said on Monday it was an excellent system. And I'm not doubting the people working in it are doing a hard uh, job and doing important work. But something's not adding up if the minister is saying that the system is effectively fine, bar a few glitches. And we're, you know, comp comparatively lower in our contact tracers, kind of compared to, you know, similar sized uh, areas, countries, regions. So something's not adding up here. So I, I would support the call to, to kind of uh, press, press more on that. Thank you, Alan. Sure, I, I didn't have the benefit of uh, of seeing the spotlight program, but I, I certainly will try and catch up with it. Uh, but in terms of what they're doing in Wales. Um, what I would like to see as well, maybe if, we, if, if we're going to look at, uh, at the, the Welsh model, is uh, the, the, their, their transmission rates. You know, how much better are they than, say, Northern Ireland in terms of you know, uh, many people are in hospital and many people have, are getting the, the, the disease on a daily basis there, just so that we can look at it and say and satisfy ourselves, well, yeah, that is working. That does have an impact. On the uh, uh, on the health of, of, of the general community, so it, it, it would be interesting just to see those figures and compare them with with Northern Ireland. So we we can then make a strong case that this works in Wales. Why are we not doing it here? Yeah, and we also have just to remind members the opportunity to talk to our next uh, international academic panel in relation to that and the evidence around all of that. And um, Pam there is indicating as well. Pam, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chair. No, I just wanted to come in. I agree with a lot of what has already been said, and I got a chance to watch the Spotlight program as well. If, you, if the rest of the committee can, it's it's not a terribly long uh, viewing, so and it was very useful. It was good to, to see what um, what the Welsh government are doing. It certainly it just it strikes me that you know I was sorry I should have declared an interest that the family member working in the chat and facing program here. Pam, but Pam, no. sorry to cut across you. You're very faint there. We're just about hearing you. Can you? A, increase your volume a wee bit, please. Yeah. Try that again now. Can you hear me now better? Yes, that's much better. Is that better? Yep. Okay, yep. Okay, earphones. Okay, so uh, I want to declare an interest that I have a family member working on the track and trace program um, presently. But I agree with um, all the commentary so far, and, and even with Pat, believe it or not. I did see the Spotlight programme and it was very interesting to see what the Welsh um, were doing on contact tracing and it does seem to be very different from what we're doing. And uh, you picked up on a point I was going to make around the mass testing as well. If, if we introduce the mass testing, we need to have that contact tracing capability in place as well. Otherwise, you know, how, how will it work? How will you maximise the impact of that mass testing? Um, and it also struck me that uh, whilst we know the contact tracing setup initially worked very, very well, and I give full credit to that. And I, uh, we know that um, that the minister didn't want to go down the line of using, you know, like call centre staff uh, style of a service, and that he wanted to have professionals and health professionals and doctors and nurses involved, so that good advice was going out as well. But that seems to have been overrun by the figures and they not being able to cope with the with the severe rise in, in positive cases and the contact tracing had to happen. So when you're moving from initially they were taking calls that were maybe lasting 40, 45 minutes and giving good advice and, and then you're going to a text message with no follow up, uh, and no checking, no advice going out. So, it, you know, I think I understand why they've gone down there, they've gone in order to cope. But it's not even their intention, as far as I can see, from what they initially uh, had in place and their plan. So I think they really do need to look at, you know, massively upskilling and looking at at how other people are doing it as well, in order to uh, maximise the the impact of the contact tracing. So I would do need more information, and I would like to have seen um, something in terms of uh, the budget where we're actually proactively looking to increase that capacity. Okay, thank you members and um okay, thank you. I think that's that's been useful. So that that's okay. We can we can uh, put those in. 
We're going to go now to our next session, which is Judith Gillespie and the Interdepartmental Working Group, but I'm going to take a short break there, just a comfort break. So if we could come back, members, for 11.15, restart. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. Okay, members, thank you. And we're going back in. Can I just remind members, um, when you're addressing your comments, speak into your microphone. Sometimes we're all inclined to look at the screen and it takes us away from the microphone. And some of the members on the video conference are having trouble following us at times. 
so members can bear that in mind. Um, so we're moving on now to our next uh, presentation this morning, members, and it's a briefing from the Chair of the Interdepartmental Working Group uh, Mother and Baby Institutions. I can advise members that the Chair of the Interdepartmental Working Group on Mother and Baby Homes, Magdalene Laundries and Historical Clerical Child Abuse is here today, along with departmental officials, to brief the committee on the work of the group so far. I do want to acknowledge that we are all, I'm sure, hugely conscious of the victims in, in all of these cases and that they may be watching on today. And I suppose that, that we just want to send our acknowledgement to them that, that we are very deeply conscious of, of the hurt that they have suffered. I refer members to tab six of your pack there. And I'd now like to welcome via video conferencing Ms. Judith Gillespie, who is the independent chair of the Interdepartmental Working Group. Ms. Eilish McDaniels, Director of Family and Children's Policy within the Department of Health, and Mr. Gareth Johnson, who is Director of Victims and Survivors Division in the Executive Office. So I'd now like to welcome you, uh, and, and Judith, I'd like, like to just welcome your appointment as, as Chair of this group. Very, very uh, glad to have this briefing this morning from you all. So can I then go across to Judith and ask you to go ahead, Judith, uh, Chair, and brief the, brief the committee, please? Thank you. Good morning, Can you hear me okay? Yes, it's, it's a little faint. If you can turn the volume up a small bit, but we can hear you okay there, Judith. Okay, Thank, thanks very much, Chair, um, and good morning to all the members of the committee. Uh, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to brief you all on the work of the Interdepartmental Working Group on Mother and Baby Homes, Magdalene Laundry, and Historical Clerical Child Abuse. I know this is a particularly challenging time for the committee, so it, it's really good to have this opportunity to, to brief you. Uh, you've already mentioned I'm joined today by Eilish McDaniel. Director of Family and Children's Policy in the Department of Health, who has lead responsibility for mother and baby homes and Magdalene Laundries. And I'm also joined by Gareth Johnson, Director of the Victims and Survivors Division in the Executive Office, as it has lead responsibility for historical clerical child abuse. Uh, members may be aware I was appointed as independent chair of the Interdepartmental Working Group with effect from the 1st of June this year uh, for an initial period of one year. And as I said at that time, I really feel honoured to be chairing this group. Uh, it's, the work of the group is approaching a crucial stage. And this role, I know, comes with great responsibility. And I do feel the weight of expectation on my shoulders. Uh, and I am keen to make tangible progress on these important matters, not least for the victims and survivors, who, as you've already alluded to, Chair, feel frustrated and neglected for some considerable time. I'm not simply the chair of this group, I'm independent of it, and I'm ever conscious of that. We are approaching a key decision point in relation to how the executive will address the needs of those individuals whose lives have been affected by what happened in mother and baby homes and Magdalene laundries. We're also about to embark on the commissioning of research, which will ultimately determine the executive's actions in relation to addressing the needs of those individuals affected by historical clerical child abuse. Members may know that the working group was established by the executive to consider evidence in both of these areas and to provide ministers with recommendations on future action. So in relation to the mother and baby homes and Magdalene Laundries research, relatively little was known about the operation of mother and baby homes and Magdalene Laundries in Northern Ireland. So the Department of Health commissioned research to examine the operation of both these types of institutions across Northern Ireland from 1922 to 1999, and also the wider historical and societal context within which they operated over that period. The research was undertaken jointly by Queen's University and Ulster University and incorporated a literature review and examination of archive records an oral history project to include testimony of former residents and other witnesses from the institutions and those who had experience of working with the institutions. Around 60 individuals participated in this strand of the research, including victims, survivors of mother and baby homes and Magdalene laundries. I understand that in oral history project terms, this is a significant number. With regard to each the research considered the entry and exit pathways of women in respect of the institutions 
the living conditions and care arrangements experienced by residents during their period of accommodation in these institutions, the mortality amongst mothers and children residing in these institutions, the post-mortem practices and procedures in respect of children or mothers who died while resident in these institutions, for children who did not remain in the care of their parents, the exit pathways on leaving these institutions, oral and written evidence and testimony from former residents, wider family and employees of the homes and laundries, and finally information in relation to other relevant matters identified during the course of the research which may warrant further investigation in the public interest. The research considered eight mother and baby homes and a number of former workhouses. It also considered four mountain and laundries. This is an overarching term not actually used in Northern Ireland but used within the research to cover a number of institutions run by religious bodies, both Catholic and Protestant, which were known by a variety of alternative names, such as asylum, penitentiary, refuge, and rescue homes. I can tell you that the last mother and baby home closed its doors in 1990, and the last regular laundry ceased operating in 1984. So this is recent history. There were around 10,500 women who entered mother and baby homes and around 3,500 women working in Magdalen laundries. These are probably conservative numbers as the records are incomplete. The research report is very substantial. It runs to 746 pages with appendices. I'm very conscious that the report isn't finalised and the approval of ministers to publish is still outstanding. However, we can give committee members a sense of what the research found in headline terms if the committee would find that helpful. There are a number of points in the report. For that reason, draft sections of the report have been shared through a process of representations, which in the interest of natural justice was intended to provide an opportunity to respond or a right to reply. The representations process is near completion and the researchers have made some changes to the report where they were considered necessary to correct factual inaccuracies, for example, or to provide clarification or more contextual information. On completion of this process, subject to executive approval, it is intended the research report will be published as soon as possible. I've been clear from the outset of my appointment that I want to engage regularly and directly with those who are victims and survivors of mother and baby homes and Magdalene laundries and of historical clerical child abuse. So following my appointment, I began a program of engagement with a wide range of individuals, with political representatives, including some of you here today, uh, and other stakeholders. I'm keen to hear direct about the lived experiences of individuals, and I'm very grateful to those who have shared their experiences with me. As part of the ongoing program of engagement, I've established a reference group of mother and baby homes, on mother and baby homes at Magna Lawrence's, and a separate reference group on historical clerical child abuse. Both groups met for the first time on the 16th of November. And again, I have to say, I'm hugely grateful to the participants for sharing their experience with the group. I know that can't have been easy. I intend to convene future meetings with both groups at key decision-making points to ensure that they are given the opportunity to inform the work of the Interdepartmental Working Group and to be fully informed regarding the work of the group. The Interdepartmental Working Group has considered the findings of the mother and baby homes and Michael and Laundry's research in great detail to help inform future advice to ministers and potential courses of action ministers might take. We've literally put everything on the table along the continuum of publishing the report without further action at one end through to a full public inquiry, similar to the Hart inquiry into historical institutional child abuse at the other end. We're exploring a range of other options along that continuum, and the benefits and limitations of each have been a subject of detailed consideration and discussion by the Interdepartmental Working Group. I presented a number of options to the reference group last week for discussion. What emerged from that discussion was, at the very least, Victims and survivors want to be able to tell their story in public. They want accountability on the part of institutions and individuals 
and they want to have complete confidence in the process that leads to this. So a public requirement might seem like the obvious way forward. At a minimum, it creates an equivalence between mother and baby homes, Michael and laundries, and other historical institutions. However, the experience of various public inquiries has taught us that hope is not always matched by experience. Every public inquiry has its own sensitivities, and there are unique sensitivities to the experience of mother and baby homes and Magdalene laundries. Giving oral testimony in public in a legal inquisitorial process has proven to date to be a very challenging experience, and one which can lead to existing trauma being revisited. I can therefore fully understand why individual members of the reference group are petitioning for any future independent investigation of these institutions to be more victim-centred. It is important for the working group under my chairing to reflect on this. It is also clear from discussions to date that time is of the essence. Individual members of the reference group have pressed for future measures to be taken forward in parallel with rather than in sequence to any inquiry. Therefore, I'm looking at a range of options, in particular victim-centred options for ministers to consider. This brings me to the issue of delay. Departments fully acknowledge that progress to date has been much slower than originally planned or than they would have liked. Based on my discussions with individuals and groups to date, I am acutely aware of the impact this has had on victims and survivors, the frustration it has caused and the disappointment it has created. I'm determined that as far as possible, any further delay is avoided in the future. In terms of why it has taken longer to get to this point, there were a number of reasons, and I will leave it to departments to answer any questions members might have about delay. As soon as we can get all the outstanding legal issues with the research report addressed, we will provide advice to ministers and put the research into the public domain. That said, this work is not without its challenges. It has thrown up issues not present in other public inquiries to date. Among them is the issue of protecting the rights of individuals who might want their property to remain in the past. I can tell members of the that the overriding reason that women entered modern baby homes, for example, was familial pressure. Judith, sorry, to... sorry, 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 Judith, for cutting across you. Your volume has dropped there just in the, the past couple of sentences. Your volume dropped a little, if you can just check that for me, please. Okay, I'll, I'll just go back to where I was. Um, the work is not without challenges. It has thrown up issues not present in other public inquiries to date. And among them is the issue of protecting the rights of individuals who might want their past to remain in the past. I can tell members of the committee that the overriding reason women entered mother and baby homes, for example, was familial pressure. Families wanted a problem to go away, and they sent their daughters and sisters away from home as a result. Often these daughters and sisters were under 18, and in some cases considerably under 18. Often they were vulnerable, often they were in a relationship where there was a power differential with the father of the child. In some cases they were victims of rape, incest, and unlawful carnal knowledge. Children were born, some of them were adopted, and the women in many cases left the institutions to get on with their lives as best they could. Of course, these issues have had a profound impact, but some have chosen for their very own personal reasons to leave that chapter of their early lives behind, and we need to be ever mindful of that. If I may, Chair, I want to turn to some of the issues regarding the Statutory Commission of Investigation into Mother and Baby Homes in the Republic of Ireland. Members may be aware that the Commission has completed its work and the report is now with Ministers in the South. I hope to meet with the Minister for Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth in the near future to advise him of the work being carried out in this jurisdiction and to hopefully get a sense of future plans there. Legislation brought forward at the end of the Commission's work attracted considerable attention and raised questions when similar issues are at play in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland. The legislation prompted reaction from survivors of the mother and baby institutions in the Republic of Ireland 
the general public, organisations and the media in both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. My understanding of the issue is that the concerns centre on the sealing of records collected by the Commission, a requirement under existing legislation brought forward in 2004. The Commission not only collected records, it created them. Again, my understanding is that the legislation passed recently in the oil enables some of the Commission's records to be passed to TUSLA, the Child and Family Agency, on the basis that they could assist with family tracing in the future. The impact of the legislation on issues relating to mother and baby homes in Northern Ireland is currently under consideration by Department of Health officials. It's unclear at this point whether the introduction of the new legislation in the Republic of Ireland has any direct implications for Northern Ireland, but officials in Northern Ireland are alive to the issues and have raised a number of questions with colleagues in the Republic of Ireland. I can advise members that tracing in connection with adoption is well established in Northern Ireland and has been in place for more than 30 years. Also, there are plans to develop that further under new adoption legislation. The issue of preserving records relating to mother and baby homes and Magdalen laundries is raised in the research report and the Department of Health is currently considering this issue. I am of the view that it's crucially important that these records are preserved and protected for access if necessary. Finally, Chair, if I may say a few words about the historical clerical child abuse strand of work. It is fair to say that this work is less advanced. However, the working group intends to commission research on historical clerical child abuse in the coming weeks. The research will focus on lessons learned from previous investigations, including case studies, examining a number of high profile cases and whether there are opportunities to improve existing safeguarding practice in churches and faith groups. It will also consider how the experiences of victims and survivors might be acknowledged and consider the adequacy or otherwise of current support services. It's important for me to say the research will not be restricted to abuse perpetrated by ordained clergy. It will also include abuse by those carrying out a role related to the ministry of a religious institution or faith group. It will seek to identify whether the abuse was systemic in nature and will consider the actions by both churches and the state in response to allegations of historical clerical child abuse. It will extend to churches other than those of the Christian faith and will cover the period from 1968. It was intended initially that the research will complete within six months, but we will probably need to review that once researchers are appointed to ensure that it is both a challenging and reasonable timescale. Plans for the research were shared with the reference group, which I mentioned earlier, and in correspondence afterwards, and changes to the draft terms of reference will be made to reflect the comments of individual members of the group. The terms of reference will shortly be submitted for ministerial approval with a view to the research commencing as soon as possible. And it is proposed that the research will be undertaken by a number of associates of the HSC Leadership Centre with the necessary expertise in this area. As with the research undertaken in connection with the mother and baby homes and Michael and laundries, the research will help inform future advice to the executive on next steps. And in the meantime, I've begun a programme of engagement with stakeholders, including churches and faith groups. That, Chair, concludes my opening statement. I'm conscious there's a, a, a serious amount of information there, uh, but it was important to put a lot of this detail on the record. And I'm very happy to take any questions which you or members may have at this stage. Thank you. OK, um, thank you. Thank you for that, Chair. And um, I suppose, first of all, I, I do appreciate the fact that you have re referenced that this process will be victim-centred. I think that's hugely important. I welcome the, the setting up of those, both of those reference groups in order to facilitate that communication. And I think, I think we would be very supportive that that will be uh, engaged on an ongoing basis and be supportive of those. And I think that is, has been clear from what you have said. I think we also do recognise the very, very important sensitivities around all of this work and that different victims will want different outcomes, will need different support and different in engagement. And I, I get a sense that that is well recognised as well. Um, 
and and it does it does just I suppose it's it's horrific the, when, when you talk about the power differentials and the rape and that the, these were children subject victims of rape and incest and those power differentials are something that that is uh, I think a, a matter of shame for our society and these these issues must be pulled out into the light and the victims recognised and supported. So I thank you for all of that. In terms of, of my question, and first of all, in relation to the timeline of publishing the research that has been commissioned, and that research I know was passed to the Department in 2019, and also the right to reply process, I think going by online minutes, the right to reply process was due to conclude in September. So I'd just like to know what the what the cause of delay now is at this point in time for research and when we expect to see that research being published. Yes, Chair, um, I acknowledge that it does certainly seem to have taken a, lot, a long time to publish. Uh, there was additional time needed to complete the research. Um, the original contract uh, stipulated a period of 12 months for the research, but it, uh, it quite quickly became apparent that it was going to take quite a bit longer to deal with uh, some of the complex issues, uh, like access to records and the methods of accessing the records. Um, the researchers were also keen to engage as fully as possible with individuals who had a direct uh, connection with the institutions before seeking ethical approval, and you'll appreciate there were a number of ethical issues thrown up by approach to victims and survivors in this type of research. So again, that took longer than anticipated. There was a further issue arose in relation to baby homes. That's not mother and baby homes, but baby homes, which the researchers wanted to uh, look at with additional time to specifically consider the issue of mortality rates. Um, the, the draft report then, when it first came to the Interdepartmental Working Group, this is before I was chair, but um, it, it raised issues around adoption and uh, we had to take council's advice or the working group had to take council's advice regarding the leg legislative framework on adoption in Northern Ireland. Uh, I understand the framework is complex. I'm sure uh, Eilish could probably give you more detail on this if, if it would be helpful. But the legislation changed a number of times over the course of the, the period covered by the research. Uh, it changed, in fact, four or five times, I think, during that time. Um, council also advised them that the process akin to max maximisation had to take place um, for those running the institutions and to, to give them uh, the opportunity to comment on the content and its findings. This was uh, not just to test the factual accuracy, but in the interest of, of natural justice. So in addition to those process issues, uh, there was also the issue of the the chairing arrangement. Um, I'm the third chair of the Interdepartmental Working Group. This is no reflection at all on the previous chair who worked conscientiously and diligently to take the work forward, but just circumstances have led to uh, changes in chairs, uh, and, and that has been a challenge as well. Um, and finally, uh, speaking on behalf of the Department of Health in particular, uh, there have been pressures around COVID. Um, and some officials have been um, diverted to, to planning for vulnerable children and young people, as I understand, during the pandemic. Uh, Eilish, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that uh, regarding the delay in the research report. Um, no, Judith, I, I think you've covered it um, all. Um, I, I, in terms of the diversion of, of staff to work on issues of present interest, um, for example, Judith has referred to the Vulnerable um, Children and Young um, People's Plan. Um, I did take staff away from this work um, to um, involve them in that work. And I think it is highlighted um, for us that we need to consider how we um, better resort this work in the future. And that certainly is something that is under consideration um, within the department. And Judith and I have had some level of discussion um, about that. I just want to assure the committee that it is something that we're currently looking at. And when can we expect publication, Eilish? Um, the, the intention is um, to publish as soon as um, possible. Um, it, it, at this stage, it will, will probably um, be early in the new year, um, rather than before Christmas um, that, that, that we uh, originally um, planned. Um, yeah, I suppose. I suppose I, th I, I kind of had an impression it was the next few weeks. But are you saying? Are you saying it will be? It will be in January. That it will not go beyond that. 
I don't think it will go beyond um, uh, January. That's certainly um, Judith's um, intention um, to ensure that the report is, is published um, early um, in the new year. There's a few outstanding issues that need um, to be um, addressed, um, and I'm quite confident um, that we will be able to address those um, uh, by early January and, get, and the, get, get the report into the public domain. Okay, I think I think given that it is, and and I do, you know, you, there has been a, a, a lot of a lot of factors within that, but I think now at this stage, victims really do, you know, would would deserve to see that to allow the process to move forward. So thank you for that. Um, moving on then to the recent decision by the uh, the government in Dublin to seal the records, uh, Judith, do you think that will impede the work being carried out by the working group, given that there were cross border adoptions? Um, there were clearly huge cross-border issues here. Is that likely to impact? And how do you interact with with the inquiry that's ongoing in the south uh, and the pro and, the, and the, the the material that has come out of that? How do you impact with that? And do you think that this needs to be engaged on an all-Ireland basis in order to ensure that there's no room for um, information falling between between uh, between the two jurisdictions in that sense? Well, again, Chair, uh, I think I've mentioned that the arrangements are currently being um, made for me to meet with the Minister in the Republic of Ireland and to discuss both the work in, in the South and uh, the work of the Interdepartmental Working Group in the North. Um, it, it's important that we get an update of how their, uh, the Commission's report might affect the work in the North. Of course, it's not published yet. But um, the more we can have early uh, indications of what that might look like and whether it might affect the work in the north, the more we can prepare for that. Uh, I know officials have had some uh, interaction with their counterparts in the Republic of Ireland to make arrangements to make sure that we are covering uh, both issues on both sides of the border. Um, and, and obviously, we want to fully understand what the implications of the report of the Commission of Inquiry are for Northern Ireland. Um, so I'm hoping that that meeting will take place within the next week or two. Um, uh, at this stage, it's very difficult to say because nobody has seen the report uh, in the South. But we are very alive to the, the issues that the research report in Northern Ireland has um, uncovered in that we know that there was movement of mothers and babies uh, both uh, south to north and north to south. So it is quite possible that there will be implications for, for uh, the work in Northern Ireland. Uh, but exactly what those look like, I can't say at this stage. Eilish, I don't know if you want to add to them. No, I, 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 you referred to it, um, Judith. Certainly within the, the report, there is evidence that um, children um, born in mother and baby homes in Northern Ireland um, were adopted not only in Northern Ireland, but also outside of Northern Ireland, including in the um, Republic of, of Ireland. Um, I mean, that, that may have been done with the consent of the child's um, mother and her family, and there are examples um, where families were actually involved in the transfer of children um, across um, the border. I think it's important to say that the law in Northern Ireland um, may have permitted um, that by way of a, a licence being obtained from a, a Northern Ireland or, or a court or in later legislation um, by way of a, a, a provisional um, adoption um, order. Um, but I think... Um, the thing that is of, of cross-border significance is the issue of adoption. And um, I can tell the committee that the report, uh, the research report, doesn't um, reach firm conclusions um, about um, adoptions um, from mother and baby homes, um, whether they were, uh, whether they followed um, the legal um, requirements um, in, in full. And I think that to get um, answers to those questions, uh, probably further research um, would be required, and it probably would be required on an all-island um, basis, um, simply because um, access to adoption records um, north and south um, would be required um, to be able to um, conclude fully um, that adoptions here um, took place um, in accordance with the law or otherwise. Thank okay. you. Thank you. And just finally, from me, before I go to uh, our deputy chair Pam Cameron on the on the phone, um, the terms of reference indicate that the strand of work in relation to the mother and baby homes will focus on the period from 1922 to 1999. But to date, the historical clerical child abuse work 
uh, you have said there is going from 1968. Can you uh, advise why that is the case in terms of the timings? Why, why are we going back to 1968 only? Yes, uh, Chair, I, I can give some indication around the thinking on that. Um, it, it was important to give the researchers some uh, parameters for the, for the research. 1968 was the year of the Children and Young Persons Act, um, and uh, it was just one of those um, sort of time, uh, time scales when we could start to look forward. That's not to say that if anybody came forward to speak to the researchers or, or if the research uncovered a significant case before 1968, uh, that they would not consider that. They will. It's just um, for the parameters of a, a piece of research, it's important to give some timelines to it, um, but that's certainly not a definitive um, date by which anything before that would be ruled out. And we are keen, and I, I'd actually like to take this opportunity to say I'm keen to speak to victims and survivors of historical clerical child abuse, and anyone, uh, regardless of when the abuse happened, um, if, if they'd like to speak to me, I would be very interested to hear their story. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go then to Pam. Uh, Pam, are you there? Uh, just check again if Pam Cameron. Pam, do you have a question, or are you? We're not hearing you in the room here at the minute. Okay, I'll come back to Pam then. I'll go to. Chair. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Pam. Thank you. I, did, I couldn't get off mute there, but somebody's released me. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for the presentation, um, everybody. And obviously, it's a subject that's very distressing, I'm sure, for very many. And we do want to see that research, the research report being made available as soon as possible. And I appreciate your commentary around those delays. I'm just asking for clarity. Um, the research report ha hasn't been made available to victims or their advocates yet, isn't that right? That's right, yes. Okay. And um, I'm just wondering, is there any prospect in term, uh, of the terms of reference of the working group being amended uh, to allow it to act on any recommendations contained in that report? And if not, uh, what's the vehicle for taking forward redress, um, forms of redress moving forward? Well, that's one of the issues that the working group is considering, um, uh, along with a range of other uh, measures um, to address what victims and survivors have talked about. Redress, acknowledgement, memorial, um, uh, therapeutic services, counselling, etc. All of those issues have been raised with me and, and through the working group, and those are all issues that we are considering as part of the options paper that will go before ministers, so you have my assurance in that point. Thank you for that. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thank you. And then Paula. Um, thank you very much for coming along this morning. Um, Judith, in your opening comments, you talked there around, um, you know, there's calls from everything right through to an inquiry, and I suppose um, I would support some of those campaigners for a public inquiry, and I do recognise the, the reasons against it as well. But you also said that um, the reasons why w young women went into these homes was familial pressure. But when the families were putting the young women in these homes, they did not expect them to be abused when they got there. And the reason why I would support an inquiry is because it would allow then those institutions who allowed and perpetrated that abuse to be held to account and give, um, give an account of, of, of why they did that. So that would, I think that needs to be put on, on the record. Um, one of the young, um, one of the um, adoptees that I spoke to, he said, I'm, I'm a 57-year-old man and I'm still waiting for my mummy to come home, to, to come and take me home. The trauma that um, not just the mothers, but also the adoptees have experienced has been horrendous and they have had a lifetime of this. The problem with the research that was commissioned, as you know, just asked for findings and did not ask for recommendations. And I suppose the problem has been this chasm in time between the report, the research report, and actually the people who've been affected accessing services. So I'm just wondering, can we can we get a bit more clarity around access to those services with more immediate effect? I know you've got the reference group, but how are the, are those people who've been affected by these, by these mother and baby homes going to be supported in the short term? Thank you. 
Uh, well, thanks for the question. And uh, certainly access to services, uh, counselling, etc., has been a key uh, feature that the working group has been considering. There is uh, also services already available with regard to adoption that perhaps Eilish might want to say more about the counselling services that uh, come as part of the um, adoption service as a mandatory part of that. Eilish, do you want to say something about that? I, I mean, uh, adoption agencies, and that includes our health and social care trusts in Northern Ireland and some voluntary adoption agencies, work very closely um, with individuals who have an interest in making contact um, with um, a birth relative, um, for um, example. So um, those arrangements are already in place and are fairly well established and have been in place for a considerable um, period um, of time. I mean, there is always the issue of things happening um, quickly, and I, I'm sure that um, trusts work with individuals um, to progress um, things as quickly as they possibly um, can, but um, some things um, need a bit of time um, to um, complete, you know, given the sensitivity of the issue um, of adoption. Um, the, the other thing that I will say is that um, there are plans under the Adoption and Children Bill um, to actually enhance um, current um, arrangements. So, for example, um, while trusts or adoption agencies may undertake that work um, on a voluntary basis at the minute, they're not required um, in law um, to do that. Under the Adoption and Children Bill, for example, um, there would be a requirement on, uh, on an adoption agency to provide intermediary um, services um, to adopted people, birth relatives, and for the first time, um, the descendants of adopted um, people um, too. And that means that um, they would have access um, to a person who acts actually as a go-between or a mediator um, between an adopted person, their birth relatives, or indeed between birth relatives and, uh, and descendants um, of adopted um, people. So I want to assure you that um, arrangements are currently um, in place and the intention is to actually enhance those arrangements under new legislation. Okay. Um, and my second question relates to the research into um, historical clerical abuse. Um, thank you. I think you read out the um, terms of reference there, but it wasn't totally clear around how that um, research is going to be commissioned. Are you saying that it will be health and social care staff, or will it go out to tender as per the um, mother and baby homes? Uh, no, it, it's, uh, the, the plan is that it will be conducted by a number of associates of the Health and Social Care Leadership uh, Centre. So it, it won't exclusively be um, social workers, it will be people with experience in investigating this type of area. Uh, the, the benefit of that it means that we can have a blended team with a wide range of skills uh, to take forward that research. So um, the, the terms of reference has, have not quite being finalised. We, we are close to that, um, but they'll have to go to ministers before that research can commence in earnest. Okay, and just, just finally on that then, um, I think part of the problem in people coming forward for the research, the previous set of research, was that um, I, I don't think people really knew that it was taking place, and I'm just wondering, have you got a plan in place to tr really try to capture this? Because as you say, some of this abuse may have taken place decades before, and we need to allow those people to know that it's, that it's happening so they can come forward and tell their story. Yes, uh, that's a really important question. And again, this is an opportunity for me to, to say that we are very keen to speak to as many victims and survivors of historical clerical child abuse as possible. Uh, I have a number of people who have come forward willing to participate in the reference group that I, I referred to. I've also been speaking to other NGOs like Amnesty, for example, and some legal representatives of victims and survivors. Uh, but I am keen to um, appeal to others to come forward to inform this research. And as part of the terms of reference of the research, there is a question around how best to engage with victims and survivors and to acknowledge their experience. So I would expect the researchers to come up with some recommendations around that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'm going now to Jonathan. Thank you, Chair. And firstly, I understand the complexities and sensitivities in relation to the completion of this report, but I suppose probably, as the Chair has outlined, it is extremely worrying uh, to, to see the lengthy delay in publishing uh, the research report. And actually, I would suggest that it goes in some way to erode trust as to what its potential findings may be, and I'm sure you're acutely aware of that. 
and given the fact that it has been with the Department since August 2019, I want to ask you the question, what assurances can you give to both families and advocates that those affected by the, these terrible abuses are not uh, being reported now as a, 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 because of COVID, uh, which is holding up the publishing of the report? And are there any legal issues involved uh, that need to be addressed before the publishing of this report? Yes, uh, I fully accept the point on eroding trust. Um, this has been going on for quite some time. I can only talk about what has happened since I took over as chair on the 1st of June this year. Uh, and perhaps Eilish can talk about what happened before that in more detail. But since the 1st of June, it has been my, um, my purpose to get this research published as quickly as possible. Uh, of course, there have been some legal issues which have been identified in the maximization process. And the last thing that any of us wants is any sort of further legal delay in terms of injunction to stop the re report being published, etc. We want to avoid that. Uh, we want, I, I certainly want to get the report out there as quickly as is possible, but without any further um, legal issues delaying that further. So the maximization process has been almost completed. There is a small number, I and mean, it is a very small number of outstanding legal issues that need to be addressed. And as soon as those are dealt with, um, the report will be put into the public domain. Um, it's certainly not the desire of the Interdepartmental Working Group to delay it any further. Um, Eilish, do you want to say anything about the delays before uh, I became chair? Um, I, I think you've already covered it, um, Judith, in, in, in response to another um, question. Um, and the department does fully acknowledge that this has taken um, longer um, than it should have um, taken. And I think the emphasis now is on getting um, the report um, into the public domain um, as quickly as possible. And I've said it, and um, I think we're quite confident that we will be able to do that um, just after um, Christmas. Sure. Can, can I just, in response, I, also, I want to commend Judith, because I, I do understand that since you've taken up the post, there has been a, a, a drive to get this published. But I want to say, I've listened to both yourself and officials, and the line is, as soon as possible, that we want to see this published. Could I suggest, to ensure confidence and to ensure that trust is not eroded, that we get a firm date for publishing? Because, uh, obviously, victims and advocates want to see this out there in the public domain as soon as possible, but I would respectfully suggest that we give it a firm date uh, so that they can prepare themselves for its findings. Well, the la again, the last thing I want to do is give a date and disappoint people again. Um, I had said in my engagements with victims and survivors that it was my ambition to have the report published before Christmas. That is still my ambition, and there is still a, a, you know, a possibility that that could happen with a very fair win. But I have to be realistic that it's more likely to be in very early in the new year. That's why I'm, I'm saying this now. It's very hard to commit to a date um, because there is always the possibility that you will disappoint people again. But you have my personal assurance that this will not be delayed any further than is absolutely necessary. And certainly from what uh, Eilish and myself are saying, uh, if it goes beyond January, that would be failure on my part. So um, I certainly hope it will be early in the new year. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And moving then to Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for the presentation. I want to just also pay tribute to all the victims and survivors who are going through all this. Um, uh, yeah, just just uh, a couple of quick comments and a question, uh, Judith. I mean, I suppose the familial pressure stuff uh, for me. I'm assuming, obviously, was was uh, in existence and strong, but it, it ignores the fundamental fundamental role uh, that the state either played directly uh, or ignored in terms of the abuse that was uh, going on. So I think that has to be uh, recognised the fundamental role played by the state in, in all this. Um, and in some cases, we're talking about the possibility uh, of trafficking of people. Um, and, and I think just on the maximisation process, my understanding of it uh, is that the research, as somebody, like Jonathan or somebody said, research was completed in August uh, of 2019, um, and in August 20, August of this year, the research was sent to the institutions uh, to presumably allow them to uh, process and uh, prepare for what was being accused. Uh, to me, that that whole process sounds uh, pretty skewed. The fact that the institutions who are being alleged to have uh, been involved in abuse, neglect, and so on and so forth, are getting research well in advance of um, 
victims and survivors. So I think that's quite concerning uh, in and of itself. Uh, but just my questions, um, Judith, have you considered or your team considered uh, recommending prosecutions or sanctions on institutions? Because I think there will be a belief that if there's research documenting serious uh, crimes and there is no uh, pressing or pushing for prosecution, then um, there will be a lot of concern uh, about that. And just finally, has there been any evidence or concerns that documentation has been either destroyed? Uh, missing or significant gaps uh, in, in research that has been uh, attempted to be um, obtained. Thank you. Okay, uh, th there are a lot of issues there that I'd like to just comment on. Um, the first was the issue of familial pressure and the role of the state. Um, it, in many cases, it was due to familial pressure, but in some cases, the families did not know that the young woman was in one of these um, homes. Um, and in, in some cases, the young woman felt that she had absolutely no alternative but to go into one of these uh, institutions because there was no other uh, no other support that she could access. Um, the, in terms of the role of the state, yes, uh, the, the research does recognise that there were state agencies involved in referral, in particular to the Michael and Laundries, um, courts, probation, police. Um, and in terms of baby homes, GPs, social workers, parish priests, um, ministers of religion, uh, there were many people who were involved in referring uh, young women to these uh, institutions. So there is the role of the state acknowledged within the, the research. Familial pressure was simply the, the, the most common um, factor in all of this. You mentioned the, the research report was uh, received in August 2019. Again, this please keep my time as chair, but I understand that there were uh, significant issues around adoption uh, raised in the first draft of the research report, which had to be clarified. Uh, the legislation, as I mentioned in my um, in, in a previous response, has been changed uh, four or five times during the time of the research report, and it had to be made very clear uh, whether the research report could definitively say that adoptions were legal or illegal and in fact in, in most cases it was just impossible to say without access to individual adoption uh, files which the researchers didn't have. So again there was a lot of detailed clarification and legal um, issues to be um, sorted out in that. Um, it was council's advice that led to the maximisation process um, that uh, when I became chair, that took place uh, as quickly uh, as I could make it. We, we made a deadline of the 18th of September, if I remember rightly. Um, some of the institutions came back and asked, uh, understandably perhaps made reasonable representations asking for some, some more time. They were given a limited amount of additional time to respond uh, so that the, the maximisation process was extended a little bit beyond um, the original date of the 18th of September. And then again, once the, the responses were received, there were a number of issues raised that required further legal um, discussion between the legal advisors of the institutions and the departmental solicitor's office. You, you mentioned then about prosecutions and crimes. Whenever the uh, people took part in the oral history project, they signed uh, uh, an information notice to the effect that there were implications if they made allegations, criminal allegations, against uh, identifiable living individuals. That had to be made clear because of Section 5 of the Criminal Law Act 1967. In other words, the responsibility to report to police uh, an arrestable offence. Um, in fact, th there, were, um, the, there were no named individuals, um, living individuals, that um, could be identified during uh, the oral history because of that. And of course, the researchers were very keen not to re-traumatize individuals who were taking part in the project. It wasn't a criminal investigation after all. So if avenues of uh, investigation or, or um, research were closed down by the person taking part in the oral testimony, the researchers didn't push um, the individuals to, to name people because that was not their purpose, really. Um, it, it is clear in, in the archive records that there were crimes disclosed, um, rape, incest, and unlawful carnal knowledge, which I referred to earlier. But there's scant detail about any of these. 
and it would be really, really challenging, if not impossible, to identify uh, living individuals from the scanned archive records that are available. Uh, and you, you, you mentioned about uh, the question about documents being destroyed. Um, there is no doubt that the archive records are incomplete. There are large um, gaps in, in the archives, um, and unfortunately, there's very little that can be done about that. But what can be done now is making sure that the existing records are preserved, and that's something that the uh, departmental officials are working on at the moment to make sure that if there is any future pie, that what does exist is preserved. I hope that addresses all the issues, but if there's anything else, you know, please come back to me. Thank you. Thank you. And Alan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Judith, uh, I acknowledge the harrowing task that uh, you and your team have undertaken, but I hope that you are taking comfort from the fact that you are enabling very important stories to be told. Um, I, I think that you're doing the right thing by not giving a, a, a date for publication at this stage. I think it is more important that you're allowed to finish your work to your satisfaction rather than rushing to, to meet a date. I know everyone is keen to see the final report. Uh, I'd like to learn more, Judith, about the Magdalene laundries. You, you know, for instance, uh, were the, the babies were they taken from their mothers when they, they when they went into these uh, laundries? Uh, were they free to walk out at, at, at any time, or were they virtually prisoners? And I wonder if you could give me maybe a brief flavour of what day-to-day -day life was like in a Magdalene uh, laundry, and, and what did the future hold? Uh, for those girls that were placed in them? Okay, uh, well, I'm going to give some headline information and maybe Eilish would follow up with a bit more detail. Um, so that there, were, there were really three different types of institutions. There was the mother and baby homes where um, young women, generally young women, went um, uh, while they were pregnant to be taken away uh, uh, sort of quietly um, and, and to have the baby. Then, in, in some cases, the baby uh, went into a baby home. Uh, in many cases, the baby was adopted or, or the mother took the baby uh, home to family or whatever circumstances she was living in. But uh, in some cases, the baby went into a baby home. So that's a second separate type of institution. Quite often, they were in the same um, site. So there's confusion between a mother and baby home and a baby home, but they were quite separate buildings. Uh, and then the third type of, of uh, institution was the Magdalene Laundries. Um, so in, in terms of the Magdalene Laundries, these tended to be women who had had the babies and who went in there for penitence or, or punishment or um, some sort of uh, uh, means of um, a, a different outcome than prison because um, women were referred to the Magdalene Laundries by the courts and by the police uh, under police safety orders. So there, it's important to understand there were three different types of institution. Uh, and maybe Ali should say a little bit more about the lived experience within the Magdalene Laundries. Um, I'll cover both institutions, um, Judith, if that's OK, and if members are um, content. And these, these are headlines um, from the research and report. Obviously, the report is, it is a lot more detailed. Uh, than this. Some of these points have already been made, but I just um, repeat them. So, um, while women were referred to mother and baby homes from a variety of sources, um, Judith has already indicated the overwhelming factor in admission um, to the homes um, was familial pressure. Um, we've also made reference to um, um, women entering um, the homes as a result of sexual crime, uh, including incest, rape, and unlawful carnal knowledge. The oral testimonies um, that were um, received um, provide a greater insight into the lived experiences um, and you know, some of the description is around strenuous physical labour um, being expected of pregnant women, um, I have to say very late um, into their pregnancies um, in some cases. Um, women provided vivid accounts of being made to feel um, ashamed about their pregnancy and explained that the atmosphere in the homes was authoritarian, was judgmental and unsupportive. Um, there was very little preparation for birth um, in, in many cases. Um, the vast majority of um, cases, in the vast majority of cases, 
trauma and often mental health issues have been an outcome um, for the birth mothers um, involved and particularly around um, their pregnancy. A number of oral testimonies um, raise concern over the issue of con informed consent um, to adoption and there is evidence um, that babies were moved from mother and baby homes in Northern Ireland to baby homes um, in the Republic and, and that and those babies um, were then adopted in the Republic of Ireland, in the US and in um, Britain. In terms of Magdalene laundries, um, then um, girls and women entered via a variety of routes. Um, referrals were made by welfare authorities, by probation, police, parents, priests, Catholic organisations, um, mother and baby homes and, and family members. And Judith has already alluded um, to that. Some records reveal that girls and young women um, who were the victims of sexual assault and incest um, were placed in the laundry via um, uh, case safety um, orders and they were issued by um, courts in Northern Ireland. Alternatively, um, some young females um, were placed um, in one of the Samiri's homes by a family member following um, incestuous abuse. And for some um, uh, women who spent many years in the laundry um, before leaving, um, you know, this has created concerns um, related to um, issues like national insurance and payments and their entitlement or otherwise um, to a pension. Um, uh, physical punishment was um, rare, um, although um, discipline um, and, 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 and the regimented um, regime um, within um, the homes, um, you know, were particular um, difficulties. A number of women spent um, their adult lives um, in the laundry and um, died there. And um, burials have taken place um, in four cemeteries across Northern Ireland and in Belfast. Those who were buried um, before the 1980s and were interred in larger communal graves um, that are marked only by a reference to the fact um, that the grave holds um, individuals um, from um, the St Mary's Good Shepherd Convent or indeed the Greenfield Residential um, Home. That's intended to be headlines um, relating to um, both sets of institutions um, in the research, but I credit um, the research is infinitely um, more detailed um, in that in terms of the findings. Shocking. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Just a really quick one. I hope it's a quick answer. It is a quick enough question. But just um, before we conclude, Judith, do you have an assessment of this at this stage of the scale of victims involved across the across the piece? Well, the, the research mentioned um, the number of women who entered the mother and baby homes was ten and a half thousand. The number of women who entered the Magdalene laundries was around three and a half thousand. Those are underestimates, but of course, in addition to the women who went into the mother and baby homes, logic would suggest that there would be a baby involved with that, and that's ten and a half thousand um, babies um, who are now um, no doubt adults. In terms of the historical clerical child abuse, that is, it's almost impossible to say. Um, and, and again, I would ask uh, anyone who, who hasn't come forward and who wants to speak to, to me uh, about their experience of historical clerical child abuse, please, I would encourage them to come forward because it's so important that their story is heard. Um, but we do know there have been a number of very high profile investigations into historical clerical child abuse, and the research will be looking at those and the lessons learned from them and any systemic issues that come out as a result. Thank you, Judith. Final quick point from Paula. I just think, it, it, for the record, it needs to be said that there was a high rate of infant mortality in these uh, mother and baby homes, so I don't think that it would be fair to say that there would be 10,500 um, adoptees out there. I would say that the number is significantly lower than that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but that is a really important point, and I'm glad you raised it, because that is an area that um, I, I would be very keen to see further research on, because uh, there is a suggestion of higher mortality rates in one of the, the baby homes, but it needs more research, and the outcomes of babies who went into those homes is a clear concern for me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Judith, and thank you, Eilish and Gareth, for your attendance here today and your presentation and answers to those questions. The committee, I would would wish you well in your in this hugely sensitive but hugely important work, and. Uh, we, we, will, we will no doubt be talking again in relation to how things are moving on um, 
and, and we are very keen that that research is published, as, as has been raised here today. Uh, and, and I think that you know, January would be certainly um, a very useful uh, timeline to, uh, if it can't be got out before Christmas, which is the, pre the obvious, I don't, want, I, I don't think we would want to see it drifting. And I, I acknowledge your commitment in relation to that today, Judith. So thank you very much, and good luck in, in the very difficult work that you face ahead. Gary Maggot and Slav. Thank you, Madam Members. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, any comments on that quickly, or will we will we go on? Okay, I think that's fairly harrowing, and I have to say, our, th our thoughts today obviously are with those very many victims out there. Sure. Yep. Go ahead, Jim. Can, can we request, Chair? Um, I think Judith here. She's still gone. Uh, is this for a committee discussion? Sorry. Yes, committee uh, yeah, discussion. Yeah. Um, Judith, uh, we're we're just going discussing it. Judith, now you can go ahead there. Yeah. yeah. Just to say, I think Judith's term is coming to an end, isn't it soon? Uh, but uh, am I correct in saying that? No. No. I'm not aware of that. She will also need the early summer. Sorry. It's only the early summer, so she would. Yeah. Just w when the re when the research is commissioned, sure. Can we request a, a briefing um, from Judith or the department or whomever? At that, because I think members, I'm sure, and probably constituents will have a lot of questions yep. um, about that when it when it comes through. Yep, members content with that. Yep, thank you, members. Um, we are now moving on to SRs. We're going to get a couple of officials on the line, and some of the officials are joining us in person. I'm going to take a really short break here just to get that that set up, so we can come back at 12:20, please. Thank you. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Okay, thank you, members. We now move on to our consideration of four statutory rules this week regarding coronavirus restrictions. I refer members there to tabs 7 to 10 of your pack, particularly to the clerk's memo at tab 7.1 and to the research paper at tab 7.2, comparing parliamentary procedures for emergency regulations. All four of these SRs are subject to confirmatory resolution. The examiner of statutory rules reported yesterday on all four and has raised no issues. The department has indicated that it plans to bring these SRs to plenary during the week commencing 30th of November. Today, therefore, is the last opportunity for the committee to consider these rules. I can advise members that officials from the departments of Justice, Communities and Finance are here to brief the committee on the regulations and to take questions. We will then consider each SR in turn, as we normally do. So, I would now like to welcome in person to our committee today um, Maura Campbell, who is Head of Policing Policy and Strategy at the Department of Justice, Anthony Carlton, who is Director of Local Government and Housing Regulations within the Department for Communities, and by video link, Mr David Hughes from the Department of Finance. So you are very welcome, Maura and Anthony in person, and David by a video link. And I would now like to invite you to go ahead and brief the committee today, please, on these SRs. Thank you. Okay. So who's, yeah, go ahead, Maura. I think I'll start, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much indeed for the, the introduction, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to brief the committee on SR 2020-2050 which is the 13th set of regulations amending the main health protection regulations, which are commonly referred to as the number two regulations. Um, and I thought it might be useful just to start by setting out a bit of the, the background to these, uh, which is that earlier this year, the executive established a strategic level working group, uh, which was tasked with overseeing arrangements for encouraging compliance with the public health restrictions this is a group that's chaired by the junior ministers in the executive office, and it brings together a number of departments and statutory agencies with a role in relation to compliance and enforcement. The strategic compliance group recommended in September that a rapid review should be undertaken of the offences and penalties then available in respect of breaches of the regulations. And this was against a backdrop of transmission rates increasing, uh, and it was intended to ensure that the suite of penalties that were available were sufficient to act as a, an effective deterrent um, for people who might uh, be minded to breach the restrictions. So the Department of Health and Department of Justice worked collaboratively on that review uh, and looked at the offences and penalties that were in place at the time across the uh, various UK jurisdictions and also in the Republic of Ireland. The Minister of Justice then brought papers to the Executive, which recommended increasing the level of some of the existing penalties and introducing a number of new offences. The Executive discussed these papers at its meetings on the 8th and 15th of October and agreed to accept the recommendations. 
The Minister of Health subsequently wrote to the uh, executive colleagues on the 30th of October to advise that he wanted to pause any changes to the existing penalties in respect of failing to provide information after international travel. And that was because uh, a UK-wide review of offences and penalties relating to international travel had just been commenced. We were already planning to leave the penalties for the other offences uh, related to international travel unchanged, which were failing to self-isolate after international travel or for travel operators failing to provide public health information. And so the regulations to give effect to the changes agreed by the executive with some amendment to, to take account of um, the changes that the Minister of Health asked us to pause were made by the Department of Health on the 12th of November and the new offences and penalties took effect from that date. In accordance with the agreed procedures, these amendments uh, are due to be debated in the Assembly Chamber on the 8th of December. The changes that took effect on the 12th of November under these regulations were firstly to replace the fixed penalties for breaching restrictions relating to attending gatherings either in public or private places that previous had, previously had started at £60 with a single fixed penalty of £200 which would reduce to £100 if paid within 14 days. Uh, we also retained the option of summary prosecution for these offences with a fine on conviction in court of up to £5,000. The regulations provide that the £200 fixed penalty notice cannot be issued again in respect of the same offence, uh, but the option of summary prosecution can then be used instead for any repeat offences. Secondly, the regulations put in place in respect of some existing offences, uh, fines and fixed penalties of up to £10,000, with the fixed penalties starting at £1,000, uh, and these relate to owners of premises and organisers of events. This was in part to differentiate between those who were merely, merely attending events or premises and those who were responsible for them. These penalties apply to the offence of not closing a business as required, breaches of the early closing requirements for hospitality and to organisers of gatherings. And thirdly, these regulations created uh, some new offences. These are not implementing measures to maintain social distancing in retail and hospitality settings and organising or participating in a large gathering or unlicensed music event. For owners or organisers, these offences are punishable on summary conviction by a fine of up to £10,000 or a fixed penalty starting at £1,000. Uh, which can increase up to a maximum of £10,000 for further breaches. And for participants at a large gathering or unlicensed music event, the lower level penalties will apply, that is, the fixed penalty of £200 or a fine of up to £5,000 on summary conviction. So thank you very much and happy to take any questions. OK, thank you. So I will... Uh, just in relation to the, the, the face masks, um, Maura, and, and I do recognise that enforcement is, 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 is a valid kind of a, an issue in terms of how we respond. However, first and foremost, I, I believe that it, it should be a public health issue. In light of that, we have raised in the past the issue around availability and the purchasing and the cost of face masks. And um, our hope that, that the department would ensure that face masks were accessible to everyone who needed them in an affordable way. Now, we haven't heard a lot more in relation to that, nor haven't seen really much evidence where that has been achieved. And in light of that, and given now that we are seeing an increase in the inf in the penalties that are attached to this, and also in light of the fact that we have seen um, where it has been it has been uh, assessed that the police operated unlawfully in, in terms of how they implemented these regulations in relation to the Black Lives Matter, and that there's a potential these will land more heavily in areas of disadvantage where people. And where people are struggling because they're more involved in frontline work, they're more dependent on public transport, they're in lower paid precarious jobs, higher occupancy housing. So, in relation to all of that, and, and in the absence of an equality impact assessment, given the speed at which some of these things are being done, what steps have been taken to address potential inequalities in how this might roll out on the ground? Thanks very much, Chair. A few issues there, so I'll try and ensure I've, I've covered all of them. Um, Firstly, in relation to face coverings, um, they were actually the subject of a, a separate uh, SR, I think SR 253, but basically that was us carrying forward the same principles uh, as we'd applied in the number two regulations, so increasing 
the fixed penalty that started at uh, £60, um, uh, which laddered up for, for further offences and replacing that with the, the single penalty of, of £200. Um, I think in general terms, the PSNI's approach and the approach of others who have enforcement uh, responsibilities, because it obviously doesn't just fall to the PSNI, has been to use enforcement as the last resort. We sometimes use the word enforcement to mean adherence to restrictions, whereas um, really they, they will seek first to engage, encourage, explain, um, and encourage people to, to apply um, the restrictions, as opposed to moving straight into enforcement action, uh, which is part of the reason why the um, numbers of fixed penalties given out for uh, breaching wearing of face coverings has been relatively low. So they haven't been seeking to penalise people for that. They've been trying to um, encourage that in partnership with others like TransLink and, and retailers um, who, who also have a role here. Um, the, you mentioned there about them having acted unlawfully. I think the um, media reporting of um, the uh, recent thematic review report by the policing board certainly gave that impression, but when you look at the report itself, I think it was actually much more nuanced than that. Um, it actually assessed the PSNI's overall um, approach to enforcement during the first phase of the pandemic as uh, broadly positive. In relation to certain protests, it referred to apparent inconsistencies and perceptions of unfairness, but it didn't actually go as far as determining that any actions had been unlawful. Indeed, that was outside the scope of that report. Instead, the human rights advisor was uh, deferring his um, position that pending the publication of a further report that's due from the police ombudsman, who has been looking in detail uh, at the, those particular events. Um, I think that work is well advanced. I don't have a publication date yet for when that report's likely to, to come out. But I think that will say more about um, those specific events, so I can't really say any more about that at this point. Um, in terms of potential inequalities, obviously, um, although just given the speed with which these sorts of restrictions, offences, penalties are, are considered, um, it isn't possible to, to do um, an assessment in that level of granular detail that, that, that we would perhaps like. But I, I am aware that when the executive are considering these matters, uh, they do reflect on the human rights implications and trying to achieve a, a balance of human rights. And in order to do so, it's uh, about looking at the proportionality of the measures that are being applied. And that issue of proportionality was something that we looked particularly carefully at uh, whenever we were looking at the level at which uh, fines should be pegged. Um, and we took uh, legal advice from the De Departmental Solicitor's Office on whether we were able to demonstrate that we were being broadly proportionate, uh, and we uh, shared that advice uh, in the papers to the executive so that they, they had that available to them. But I think it, you know, it all comes back to what I was um, saying from the outset, that um, the police are not seeking to take a punitive approach. They're not wanting to take a heavy-handed approach overall in terms of um, the enforcement of the restrictions. We'd much prefer the public to accept that there's a collective responsibility um, and that there are, are roles here for, for a number of um, other organisations to play and Anthony will be speaking a, a little bit later about the role of, of local government as well. Um, so really we want to see people um, be, being responsible and accepting that they have a role personally, collectively to keep themselves safe, keep, keep others safe as well. Okay, thank you. And I'll just just at that point, I'll check. Is there? Um, well, first of all, quickly before I move on, you said relatively low number of enforcements. How many are we talking? I don't have uh, the most up-to-date figures in front of me, but the police do publish on a weekly basis on their own website uh, the number of uh, penalties that they've awarded under the different uh, regulations. So that information is publicly available. Okay, and I'll, I'll come back on that point. But I just wanted to check: Are there briefings from the other officials before we go into wider questions? Sorry, Anthony. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead with oh, your sorry. briefing, and then we'll take the questions, sure. and you can, and you can then answer the specific ones that relate to your area of okay. of, uh, of of interest today. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair and, and members. Uh, as I say, the. The, my name is Anthony Carlin. I'm the Director of Local Government Policy in uh, DFC, and I've been asked to come along to just to take the lead on Amendment 14 um, of SR 2020-255. Uh, this 
is really dealing with a uh, premises improvement notice. And uh, Maura has outlined the background with, with meetings with junior ministers, etc. Uh, through those meetings, SOLIS, which is the Society of Local Government Chief Executives, asked if they could, if, if uh, legislation could be introduced to allow what is currently, essentially, the, through environment health legislation, uh, they introduced a notice which gives premises 28 days to improve or correct uh, 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 a deficiency. <clears throat> Well, certainly within the, the, the uh, current situation, 28 days notice really is, is far too long. So they've asked for a similar approach uh, with 48 hours notice. So the, the regulations are introduced to allow uh, key designated officers uh, within the local government uh, council area to issue on the premises uh, improvement notices that they have to comply with within 48 hours. Now, there are no fines or anything if, if, if they fail to comply with the, the improvement notice because it will move on then to the next level of, of uh, compliance, which may be a matter of closure. Um, the thinking and rationale behind the process, I think, it, it is very sensible. It's generally speaking for maybe lower level uh, premises, maybe where premises haven't got uh, sufficient hand uh, sanitising units at the door or their, their, their queuing system isn't quite what it should be, so the environmental health officers or the designated officer can go along and speak to the owner of those premises, alert them to the, the difficulties and ask them to make the improvement within uh, 48 hours. Now, the regulations require that that notice is, is served on, on the premises owner or somebody who to, to the, uh, gives the impression to the uh, enforcement officer that they are in charge and a suitable notice has to be uh, displayed publicly. So fundamentally, that it is, Chair, at, at, it's at that lower level, so there could be a quicker intervention as part of the education process to, to alert the premises owner to the fact that they need to improve some of their, their facilities in order to comply with regulations. Thank you. And can I check with David then? David, do you have a briefing as well mm -hmm. before uh, we go on to your... You're on mute there, David. You're still. You're, just take yourself off mute, please. I can just talk through um, the amendment number fifteen regulations. Um, these were made on the thirteenth of November, um, as the number nine regulations came to an end, effectively extending schedule two of the number two restriction regulations um, until midnight on the twenty sixth of November but also reflecting decisions of the executive around relaxing restrictions in a couple of areas, in particular on close contact services, where extending the restrictions only to the end of the 19th of November and then lifting them, but inserting terms under which close contact services can uh, operate again, um, requiring appointment system and requiring the collection of contact details from customers. Um, it also, only extended the restrictions upon unlicensed food and drink premises for a further week, um, and then lifting them on the 19th of November, the end of the 19th of November, and placing uh, restrictions on the hours that unlicensed food and drink premises were able to operate. Uh, and finally, lifting a restriction that had been in place on um, pubs and bars uh, selling under their um, off-sales license, um, and allowing them to do so, but are on the condition that they only sold in the manufacturer's sealed containers. So it's just a, a relatively small number of small of changes um, that came into play on the 20th. Of okay, thank you. So I'll go. I'll go back then, just in relation to Anthony. Um, the, the information there that you provided us with and the, in terms of retail settings and hospitality. So I'm wondering, given risks are clearly posed across a range of workplaces, and in fact we, we are seeing some of the greatest risk within some of the food production processes, for example, but even, say, office settings and other work settings, why were, why were other work settings, including potentially this, this assembly as well as a work setting, why were other work settings not included within that? Well, the other work sites are, are, are generally covered by employee health and safety regulations, and the environmental health officers you know, in, in, in have greater powers where there is a risk to health and safety of employees. So, so their powers are quite specific in terms of employee and employee settings. The, the, the issue we're looking at here would be for members of the public, 
generally speaking, who are visiting um, the, the, the premises in question, of which obviously uh, health and safety at, at work wouldn't necessarily apply to those. And what we, what the, the, the local councils were really concerned about was, let's say, given a 28-day notice to improve would not have helped the situation. Uh, and what they wanted was uh, the ability to respond and get the premises improved in a much quicker spell. But I say it really is for those members of the public and uh, where the risk of, of transmission uh, um, may be exaggerated if, if there are the hygiene or the queuing or simply even you know, the, the, the idea of, of logging names, uh, contact numbers on the way in. Wasn't, wasn't, it might be there, but it wasn't quite in the format that the, the regulations would have envisaged. So rather than go to closure, I think the, the improvement notice is there to say, look, premises owner, here's the thing you need to do to improve this. Okay, thank you. Maura, returning to the issue about availability of masks, and, and I do want to drill into that a little more in terms of we are in a situation here, we were anyway, and, and COVID has exaggerated and exacerbated it, but people are on low incomes, are out there literally choosing between heating and eating and the uh, the onus on them to buy masks and that now is something that is genuinely creating difficulties out there so what commitment can you give us that that issue will be looked at in order to ensure that no one um is is the subject of of unfair enforcement in the sense that they weren't able to do the thing they were being asked to do and what supports can be put in place to ensure that people who need access and, and are struggling to access masks or anything else in relation to support that that is being uh, that that's being looked at to by the departments or by the working group um, it isn't an issue that has been speci specifically looked at by the, the Department of Justice, but I think in um, some of the cross-cutting groups chaired by the Executive Office, um, the issue of availability of uh, face coverings and encouraging retailers maybe to, to, to help with provision as well is something that I think has been discussed. I haven't been personally involved directly in any of those discussions recently, but certainly it's an issue I'm happy to, to take back. And finally, for me, before I go, first of all, to Pam, on the, our deputy chair on the phone, um, you'd mentioned there are a number of considerations that were, were taken by the executive office in relation to um, equality and, and how things were impacting. Uh, it, would, it would strike me that it would be very useful, and I think it would be good if you would commit that those would be those considerations will be shared with the committee because we obviously don't have equality impact assessments. We can't do consultation. There is no SL1. So those considerations would help potentially to inform our consideration of the measures. Can, can that be facilitated? Um, I'm happy to take that issue up with the Executive Office. Now, this is information that was included in papers to the Executive, which are um, usually treated as, as confidential. So I would need to, to take some advice on, on what information could be shared from them. Yeah. So I think we're, we're looking to see that, that, that maximum consideration. Okay, I'm going to go then to Pam on the phone. Pam, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, for your presentation again. Um, obviously, uh, we've placed on record many times, especially in the Assembly, our frustration at um, looking at these regulations long after the pass, but we understand why that is under the uh, emergency legislation. Uh, I do have a, a question on these current regulations, but if I could just take this opportunity, because I haven't been able to get the response from elsewhere um, in and around the circuit breaker that's coming into effect over the next two weeks. Um, and it's, uh, I've had people contact me who are concerned who, um, who work in concession stores within department stores. The concession stores are non-essential. Uh, but the department stores have an element of homeware, so they're deemed as essential, and they've been told that they, they, they will be remaining open over the next two weeks. I just wanted to get clarity that they are allowed to do that. And that, that, that could you also clarify the restrictions come into effect as of one minute past midnight tonight for that circuit breaker? Yep, I think that's to you, David, there, isn't it? Yes, I can respond to that. The uh, yes, new uh, the new restrictions regulations will come into effect um, uh, one minute past midnight tonight, so they're in place for tomorrow. Okay. Um, the question about how uh, uh, retail outlets, which are as it were multiple uh, retail outlets, 
um, is one that has been looked at in the um, drafting the regulations, in particular in the context of um, uh, you just you describe department stores where they have many departments, and some of those departments may fall within the category um, that may be deemed essential. That's been looked at in the drafting of the regulations until that uh, those draft regulations are approved. Um, um, I, I can't tell you exactly how that has been settled, um, but uh, certainly ministers have been aware of the issue um, that it is not always clear whether a retailer uh, qualifies as an essential retailer, um, and so that will be that will be clarified with the regulations which um, are being finalised. Okay, so just coming back on that then, by the time we have the answer, probably the two-week period will have passed. No, the answer will need to be absolutely clear by the time the regulations are in place. By tonight, one minute past midnight tonight. Well, so, so, as, so, as <laughs> the, I, I, I appreciate that um, we would all love to be able to do this with a little bit of margin, a greater margin of time before they come into place, um, but we're attempting to get them there as quickly as possible. As, as soon as the regulations are published and the guidance is published, it will be clear how um, the definition of essential retailer um, has been carried through this process. Okay, so when will that guidance be published? The guidance and regulation will be published as soon as possible today. Okay, we'll look forward to that. And now, on what we have in front of us today, I just wanted to ask, um, uh, in relation to, it's probably for Anthony actually, in relation to the, um, the improvement notices issued by councils, if we have um, any data around how many notices have been issued, so far, and um, I also wanted to ask whether the because I'd asked previously in other um, presentations in the round contact details that were being taken in terms of contact tracing for hospitality, for instance, and I had asked whether the contact details were specified in the legislation. Was told that they weren't. So I'm just wondering, has that changed? And are you know are are we now specifying? You know, name, address, telephone, postal address, well, email, whatever specific detail is required. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Chair. The, the answer the, he says to the first question <coughs> is I don't think any improvement notices have been issued yet on, on the basis that they were only introduced. Um, and it's, sorry, I'll, I'll take a guess, it's unlike, well, very unlikely, many improvement notices will be issued during the current circuit breaker. There aren't that many premises that, that, that will be open. Um, in terms of the specifics of contact details, I, I'll have to come back to you because, as far as I know, it was name and telephone number were, were the two, but I'll, I'll have to clarify it exactly uh, what the contact details are. But as far as I know, it's name and contact number, not address. Okay, it's just, and I just want to clarify why I was asking that, and it's in it's in the context of say, you want to go to the pub, and you're allowed to go to the pub, and there's restrictions on how many households should be at a table. You know, how do you kind of demonstrate that that's you're actually following the law there if if you're not taking uh, even a a postal address? So that's the context of why I'm asking the question. If you wouldn't mind taking that back. Yeah, well, I appreciate. Well, can I, uh, sorry, just appreciate. Can I come in? There are two different. I mean, sorry, before David, that, that there are two different. I think purposes. The contact detail is for con is is tracing purposes. The issue about six, you know, a family of six or eight or two people it is a, a separate uh, regulatory uh, uh, route. David, were you looking in on that issue? I, I was. I was just going to come in because I happen to have the the, the number fifteen. Amendment regulations has that clause in it in respect of close contact services, where it is explicitly it's the name and telephone number of the customer, the number of other people from that customer's household who may be accompanying them, and the name and telephone number of anyone from outside that household who is accompanying them. That's then joined to the time of the appointment and at the time the person arrived. So um, that that detail has been requested solely for the purpose of being able to contact them and to make the connections if, if, if they need to be contacted for contact tracing purposes. As, as Anthony says, um, that isn't about identifying them in any other way. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Jerry? Thanks, Chair. Um, just in regards to Anthony, um, 
I confident are you that the councils are sort of fully equipped with staff to investigate and um, kind of deal with these issues, obviously with all the staff and pressures that they have. Uh, and then a couple of comments and questions um, on Amendment 4. Um, I mean, obviously, face masks are, are incredibly important. We all understand that, but you know, it's worth remembering that it was only in August where, where the department made them compulsory in shops. And I'm, I'm qu quite concerned, Chair, a bit like yourself, that uh, we're being told there's a relatively low level of fines issued, but um, there's a rationale being given to increase them. So I don't understand what the rationale is. The May it seems to be an unfair policy, could potentially backfire. Uh, and also could target people, you know, from depraved communities, low incomes, no incomes, people on benefits, and, and so on and so forth. But to me, that that seems to be a glaring point that could be, and uh, it seems to be bad policy. And, and just finally, just on the the policing uh, aspect, um, uh, the policing board report said that a court might rule that the actions of the PSNI were unlawful. So it's hardly a ring endorsement of their their actions on the on the June six protest. Just for the just for the record. Okay. Thank you. Um, and going then, Jerry, the, the, that's a comment more than yeah. The last one was a comment, Chair. Just for, for what's the, your question, Jerry? The question was about just the rationale for the increased levels of fines because um, I think more you said, I'm quoting you, you said the, there's been a relatively low level of fines um, already. So what's the rationale for for increasing them? I think it was just uh, the executive were looking in generally at this. Um, lower level fine of £60, and I think there was a feeling um, within the executive that a £60 fine perhaps wasn't in itself uh, much of a deterrent, bearing in mind that if you pay it within 14 days, it, it reduces to £30. So it was the principle. Um, it, they didn't sort of single out face coverings uh, when they were discussing that. They were looking at that alongside all of the fines uh, that at that time uh, attracted a penalty of, of, of £60. Um, it was felt that there was a risk that people might think, well, for the sake of 30 quid, I may as well breach the restrictions. So it was trying to incentivise people um, to, 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 be, to take more care with them. Um, but ultimately, it was, it was a matter for the executive to make the call on what level they wanted to peg those at. But they were informed by um, the review that the uh, Department of Health and ourselves undertook, where we looked at what is happening across um, other parts of these islands. So that's really all I can say in terms yeah, can of, I just clarify of the rationale. Sure, because I think it is important. Um, I know you don't have the figures, up to date figures for this week, uh, Maura, but there's no, or is there a general trend in the last two, three, four months um, that there has been a, a significant increase in fines issued um, for people not wearing a face mask? Because if there isn't, then there begs a serious question about why, this, why we're being asked to endorse this. I think I would need to seek that information for you. Just, okay. I, I don't it's have pretty major. I appreciate you don't have everything in front of you, but I think what we're discussing, it, it's pretty significant. But I appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you. Chair, do you want me just to quickly address yeah. the staffing? Thanks. Thanks. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're uh, in, in weekly contact at, at, uh, sort of with, with uh, Solis, uh, the chief executives, and um, number one, they're, they're quite confident that they have the resource available to, to um, deliver on the improvement notices. Primarily, it will be their uh, environmental officer staff, supplemented by other uh, staff members, either who are currently on furlough or on other duties. On top of that, the, the uh, Minister for Communities has provided a considerable amount of additional funding to each of the, the councils to allow them to help with the COVID recovery process and, and the management of COVID. And uh, today, Solis ha have certainly given us the indication that they, they, are, they have sufficient staff to deal with this particular matter. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan. Thank you, Chair. And I, I just want to say to the officials about the absolute madness it is that we are here on the 26th of November discussing regulations whenever a new set of regulations are due to come into effect tomorrow and the public still don't understand what exactly is involved. And I suppose this question is probably to David, and it's in relation to what Pam had said earlier. What is essential retail? What is non-essential retail and what is homeware? Can you give me a definitive list here in this committee today? Because we're sitting at 12.50 a.m. Businesses across this pro province are still unaware of whether they can reopen tomorrow 
continue to operate or not. They have also had the added insult that large retailers are open, selling the exact same product that they have in their own shops, and the small independent retailer, which represents the backbone of our economy, are forced to close. There's a lot of anger out there, David, and I believe that we as a committee need to see the answers here from you today. I understand what you said in relation to a, a publishing of a document later on today. It needs to happen, and it needs to happen now, because we need clarity for these businesses. So, can you provide me with that information now? Well, clearly, um, the executive announcement that was made earlier set out um, uh, the basic principles upon which the uh, restrictions will be placed from tomorrow, um, and that uh, that set out. Um, pre-existing list of essential retail that was used in the spring. Um, the executive decision was that that was the basis upon which uh, essential retail would be defined again now. Um, obviously, for tomorrow, the announcement will be made um, with uh, the publication of guidance and also the publication of the regulation. Those are still to be uh, finally signed off. Um, it wouldn't be my place to make an announcement um, to the committee when I'm here to uh, brief on the amendment number 15 regulations. Um, I think it's also uh, just worth responding to the, the, the point there um, about the definition of, of homewares, uh, where an attempt has been made to ensure that there is a definition in guidance um, where homewares are um, those products or goods which are um, for the equipping or furnishing of a home. I think that uh, that sufficiently captures uh, that category. Um, but uh, I, I point back to the announcement that was made previously by the executive um, about the nature of the essential retail as was defined in the spring. Thank you, Chair. But do you understand the, the anger and the fury that we're hearing here at the committee today that that final guidance has yet to be issued? Given the fact that businesses can't operate in, in this uncertainty in relation to we will issue the final guidance tomorrow whenever it's official that they have closed, they need it now because they need to know, they need to prepare. So I, I find that, and I want you to carry that back if possible through the chair, we need information before the regulations come into effect because it's, it's useless to those businesses carrying on into the, the actual day in which the regulations come into effect. They need to know to prepare the way. And moving on, and it's, it's, it's in relation to the fixed penalty notices, because they're, they're both, they're both uh, uh, correspond and complicable. And, and I appreciated what was said, I think it was Moira, in relation to uh, the fixed penalty notices that have been issued, that there's a, um, information on the police website in relation to those. Is that broken down by offence on the police uh, website, or is it just the numbers? Uh, I think it is broken down both geographically and by the different type of notice. So they have they refer to a cove one, two, three, four, five, and there's a definition on the website setting out what that notice relates to. So uh, you should be able to, from the, the information the PSNI provide, get a fair level of detail in terms of um, the penalties that are, are being given out for different types of, of offences under the, the regulations. Okay, and, and as the regulations change. Is there a lag period between police enforcement and those uh, regulations changing, given what we've heard here today, that you know, information isn't forthcoming until the actual day? In fact, sometimes it's even longer than that. Is there a lag period in terms of enforcement action? There's a lag period um, between a decision being taken um, on the creation of any new fixed penalty and when the police are in a position to implement that, and that's because um, there's a, a process they need to go through um, both to um, ensure that automated systems are updated, um, which includes linkages to the court service who are responsible for the collection of the, the fines, uh, but also they have to design um, and get published a new fixed penalty notice. And there's a requirement in legislation for those notices to provide a certain level of information about the, the applicable offence. So there's always been... Um, Ever since the, the start of these regulations, any of those new fixed penalties, there's always been a, a lag of a couple of weeks uh, for the police to be able to um, have those notices available and, and distributed to, to frontline officers. But we've all, always ensured that the commencement of regulations are time to ensure that those measures are, are in place so that there's no gap in enforcement. 
So, for instance, um, we, we didn't commence um, this set of regulations, uh, the, the number 13 amendments and the, the number 4 amendment to the face covering regulations, until the police were able to confirm that they were ready for implementation. Okay, well, we'll have we'll have to we'll have to move along. Um, so I'm going to go then. And could I, we are getting a little bit tight for time. So could I ask members and officials to be as brief as possible with questions and responses, please? I'm going to Paula. Um, thank you very much. Um, just to come back to a point I raised, I think it was maybe two weeks ago, was maybe with yourself, David, around advice for students coming in um, at Christmas. Is there any progress going to be made in terms of guidance or, or access to asymmet, um, asymptom? Can't get the words out. Testing for students. I'm sorry, I don't. I don't have any information on that myself. Um, that's one I need to take a question back elsewhere. But I think it was the Department for the Economy that would be in the lead on that. Okay, no problem. Thank yeah. you. Okay, very quickly then. Um, my question was in relation to the images that were on social media at the weekend of the queuing outside the shops, and I see that the, the wording in in one of the amendments. Can't remember which one it was. It was it. That they, the shop owner had responsibility for not just within but without in terms of social distancing measures. So, just want you to comment on the responsibility for that and then the enforcement. So, that, a queue like that appears is that for the police to go and give fines? Is that the environmental um, enforcement officers and council? Or who, who would control that and, and monitor city centre um, problems like that? I think, in, in relation to um, what happens in retail establishments. There are duties placed on the owners or operators of the premises to ensure that those social distancing measures are in place. Now, I think shop owners reasonably would say they can only be responsible for the areas that they can control. So, you know, if people are further up the street, they may be more limited in what they can practically do. Um, they and they are asked to encourage people to apply um, the, the proper social distancing, hand sanitising, and etc. Uh, and make sure that staff are equipped with um, the equipment that they need to, to work safely. Um, so the police would only be called in where there was a very obvious breach. Obviously, the police can't be everywhere at once and are not going to be going around patrolling Marks and Spencers looking for people not complying. I think it would only be if, if it was reported to them that there are instances of non-compliance that they would maybe come in. And again, they would still use the, the four E's approach. So they would be starting with you know, engaging, encouraging, explaining before they would um, move into enforcement action, um, and they would take into account any any individual circumstances as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and Alan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a, a brief point about the face mask. I know they they are quite expensive, uh, the, uh, the professional ones that you buy from the shops, but. Um, and we talked about families that are in poverty, and, and yes, that would be a big drain on their budget. But uh, maybe the message isn't gotten out enough that it's sufficient, I think, just to wrap a scarf around your face, and that becomes a face covering. So maybe we need to promote that message to those who feel that uh, the expenditure of, of masks is, is, is a stretch for them. In, in relation to essential shops, it, it is there is an awful lot of ambiguity. I mean. There's a multinational fashion store uh, in my constituency that probably 95% of its business is fashion. 5% is uh, bedwear, sheets, pillowcases, blankets. They are proposing the open because that aspect of their business is, falls within the category of being essential. Uh, but it, there doesn't appear to be anything in the regulations uh, that prevents them then uh, selling the other 95% of their stock, which is purely fashion. And if there was a shop next door to them, which was a fashion store, but didn't have that 5% of, of uh, bedware and stuff, they, they, they'll be locking their door. So is there anything in the regulations, for instance, I'm not advocating that anybody would do this, uh, but is there anything in the regulations to stop, for instance, say, a, a, a large uh, toy store? Uh, bringing in uh, a couple of bays of shelving and a, and a fridge, uh, and bringing in bread and milk into their store, uh, and saying that, well, look, uh, now we, we fall into the, uh, the category that we're essential shop because we're selling food, bread and milk basics. Uh, so we're going to open, uh, and yes, we're going to sell all the toys that we have around our store. Uh, because we have now 
created ourselves to be an essential shop. So, is there anything in the regulations to stop anybody doing that? And by extension, if there is, if, 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 if you can't stop a toy shop doing that and, and breaking, you know, find a loophole, then surely uh, the other loophole of the fashion store uh, ha has to be closed as well. Thank you. Yep. Again, I think this is, this, is, this is straying into the area of regulations which haven't yet been made. Um, but it's, it's worth pointing out that um, where across the UK jurisdictions, restrictions on uh, non-essential retail have been put in place, in some places um, it's been a matter of what the product is that is for sale. And in other places, it's the type um, of shop or the type of store um, that is deemed essential or not essential. Um, here in spring, um, we've certainly taken the route of defining the type of store or the type of shop rather than the products that are for sale. Um, so that a food rate retailer is a food retailer, not a shop that happens to sell novelty chocolates alongside their shoes and, and, and handbags. Okay, thank you. Um, and a really quick question, Colin, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, look, Chair, in terms of this conversation we're having, not, not directed at the panel that are here, but it's ludicrous and it's preposterous and it's fundamentally unhelpful. Um, that is, I'm sure, feelings that every MLA will resonate with because when these guidelines shoot, we get bombarded with questions. We have made the point before, the methodology of how we do this and the detail in the descriptions is insufficient. And we have to send the clearest possible message to the executive that they are not being helpful to the business community um, and they're not being helpful to the MLAs who are expected to give guidance um, to people within their constituencies. I echo 100% what Alan said there. Um, we are, you know, you're seeing people that are selling a whole range of products that have nothing to do with what's permitted, but they throw up a few cups and suddenly they're selling essential, uh, essential homeware and they're able to open. And I know it requires the public uh, to enter into a spirit uh, of trying to stick to these regulations, but there are many that stray from it and we need to continue to write to the department and write to the executive and tell them that the current processes are not adequate. Okay, thank you. And um, you did reference there, so one of, one of you did reference that uh, there will be guidance published today. Can I ask on behalf of retailers and anyone else who needs or wants to access that guidance where they can, where they can access the guidance for retailers? David? Um, I'm expecting that it will be published um, either on the Executive Office website or the Department of Health website. I'm sorry I can't be uh, specific on that one, but it would be if you one or the other, if not both. Okay. Quick, Very quickly, John. Can I ask that we as a committee get uh, a copy of that guidance in relation to essential retail, non essential, and homeware? I think that's essential that we as a committee get prior notice and prior publication if possible. Yep. So, uh, yeah, can you can you uh, send that information to the committee, David? Yeah, certainly. Make sure that happens. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you to our panel of officials for coming today and for answering and addressing all those questions. And good luck to you all in the in the days ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Okay, um, members, we are. Moving on then to uh, our consideration of correspondence. Oh, sorry, no, we're going to the consideration of each of the of each of the rules formally. Is what we need to do first. So, um, I'm going back now to. So we're starting off with SR twenty twenty forward slash two five zero. I refer members to t your papers at tab seven of the pack. This SR imposes additional requirements in relation to food and drink, new requirements in relation to social distancing, and new requirements in relation to large gatherings. They also make consequential amendments to the provisions on offences and penalties and fixed penalty notices. This SR was made and came into operation on the 12th of November. Have members any further issues you wish to raise in relation to that? No. Thank you then. Can I ask 
if members ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 250, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 13, Regulations 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, Members. Uh, SR 2020 forward slash 255, then, and I refer Members to papers at tab 8 of your pack. This rule provides district councils with the power to designate persons to enforce the number two regulations and to issue a premises improvement notice where those responsible for premises are in breach of the number two regulations. This SR was made and came into operation on the 13th of November. Have members any further issues they wish to raise? No. Therefore, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 255 the Health Protection Coronavirus Regulations 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? We are agreed. Thank you, Members. Moving on to number item 9, SR 2020 forward slash 256. I refer Members to papers at tab 9 of your pack. This rule provides for the restrictions in Schedule 2 to be extended to the end of Thursday, the 26th of November. They also introduced modifications of those restrictions from the 20th of November. Close contact services and driving instruction may be provided only by appointment, and client information must be taken and retained for 21 days. Unlicensed premises providing food and drink may open between 5 a.m. and 8 p.m. Bars and public houses may provide an off-sales business. Off-sales must be in a manufacturer's original sealed packaging. An error in earlier regulations is corrected, and there are some technical amendments. This SR was made and came into operation on the 13th of November. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? No. Thank you, members. So they can I then ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 256, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions number two, amendment number 15, regulations NA 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, members. Moving on to item 10, SR 2020 forward slash 253. I refer members to papers at tab 10 of your pack. This SR was made and came into operation on the 12th of November. The rule provides for a simplified fixed penalty regime in respect of face coverings regulations, whereby the amount of a fixed penalty shall be £200 or £100 if paid within 14 days, and to provide that the recipient of a fixed penalty notice cannot be issued with another one in respect of the same offence. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule, Jerry? Thanks, Chair. Yeah, Chair, I have serious issues with this generally, but it's even more worrying that the Department didn't even give us a sense that there has been an increase uh, in fines issued. Um, the, the official said, sorry, the official said they were relatively low, um, uh, and the only rationale for it um, seemingly is that some in the executive or several people in the executive sort of recommended this. Um, so I, I think it does represent bad policy. Um, potentially unfair policy, um, and I think that that's my position. But I think the committee should um, express its concern on it generally. Um, so I, I want to make it clear that I certainly have reservations about this. Um, and if we see the the, the numbers eventually um, before Monday or Tuesday, um, probably opposition to it. So I, I cannot give my support for for a multitude of reasons to that to that um, amendment, sir. And, and uh, I suppose we can reflect that concern in terms of the debate, but also the, the, uh, the officials have acknowledged that they will bring that issue back for further consideration. Um, so a member is content with that. And then can I ask members formally then in relation to the rule? Uh, so the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 253, the Health Protection Coronavirus Wearing of Face Coverings Amendment Number 4 regulations. 2020 and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Yeah, we agreed. Thank you, Members. Okay, Members, moving on then to the SL1 before us today, the Food and Feed Hygiene and Safety Miscellaneous Amendment Regulations NA 2020. I refer you there, Members, to tab 11 of your pack. 
The Food Standards Agency advises that the Department of Health proposes to make a statutory rule to enforce Regulation EU 2020-354 on establishing a list of intended uses of feed intended for particular nutritional purposes and repealing Directive 2008-38-EC here in the North. The statutory rule will also correct an omission in the Official Feed and Food Control Regulations NA 2009 and make other minor consequential amendments relating to Part 3 of the 2009 regulations. Uh, I can advise members official from the FSA is available to respond to questions if required. Do members have any questions in relation to that SL1? No. Okay, members. We'll then move on to. Um, so, are the committee therefore content that the department wishes to that the department makes the statutory rule? Yep. yep. Members are content. Thank you, members. Moving on, members, then to correspondence. And can I refer members to correspondence at tab 12 of the pack and to the correspondence memo at, 12, at, at tab 12.1? Have members any comments or proposals on any of those pieces of correspondence? No. Um, members, will draw attention there to item 12.6 was from the Equality Commission, raising issues about the use of the cross community vote in the, in the executive in respect of public health regulations. Um, and I, I just wondered, would members be content that we forward that correspondence to the executive, uh, noting the concerns raised about public health issues being decided in that way, and requesting that the issues be taken into consideration in future decision making? Agree. Yeah, or Leah. Yes, Chair. Just to say, I agree with that. I mean, I think it was quite significant. Um, the fact that the cross community vote was used at that stage, um, and I know we haven't really covered it um, as as a committee. But I think the letter that's come in um, from the Equality Coalition, it is quite extensive. There is a lot of detail contained within it, so I think it would be worthwhile to have further discussion or to forward on to the, the Executive Office, as you suggested, I would be in favour of that. Okay. Um, so, are members content with that proposal? Yep, yeah, thank you. Are members otherwise content then with the proposed actions in the correspondence memo at tab 12.1? Yes, thank you, members. There is in table papers. There is one additional item of correspondence that I want to bring to your attention. It's 12.17 there, and it's from the Children's Law Centre, um, and it's bringing to our attention a decision in the English Court of Appeal in relation to the extension of temporary children's social care regulations. We advise that the court ruled that the lack of consultation was illegal in this case, and the Children's Law Centre believes there may be a read across to this jurisdiction. So, have members any comments, or would they be content to forward to the department for a response in relation to that? Any comments on that? Or Leah, was it that issue you were looking to come in? No, at? sorry. Okay. Um, any would members be content that we forward to the department for their response on that issue? Okay. Yeah. Content. content. Thank you, members. Um, I'll, I'll bring in the AOB. Or do you want to come in, earlier? Go ahead. I'm so sorry, I, I tried to get your attention just before you moved um, onto the table papers. Um, just quickly on 12.3. The minister's response around the substance um, use consultation. Um, I just think it might be an idea that um, I'm glad to see, first of all, that additional sessions are being held, um, and that was something that me and the minister had spoke about when I met with them last week. But I also think that the committee should consider responding to that consultation as a committee because it's a really important piece of work. And then, just finally, on 12. 14. Um, it was a, a, a letter that we've received in from the, um, the Association on Infant Mental Health. Myself and Robbie Butler met with the Association at the end of last week, and it was just to see if we could maybe factor that in to our Fort Work programme. I know that we're, we're trying to set aside some time to look at different themes around mental health, um, and if other members are content, I think that issue around the infant mental health. It's actually really significant and important around prevention um, in, in later years. So, if we could add that on to affect that in somewhere when we're covering those issues. Thank you. Members content with those yeah. items? Um, Clark, Chair. in relation to engage, uh, uh, Pam, sorry, go ahead. Yes, Pam, you were looking in there. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, no, it was just to say, on, um, Orlea had mentioned that 12.3, the reply from the Minister around the substance abuse. Um, and it's just, I just think it's worth noting that. You know, 
certainly from my perception, you know, addiction is addiction, whether it's gambling or it's substance misuse. So I don't think it's the type of thing that you can just departmentalize and, and put, put it into communities or whatever. So I think um, there's further looking needs done on that particular issue. Um, and um, I, I agree with um, the noting of 12.6, but just just for your own um, records, Chair, I think you said the Quality Commission, you meant coalition, just in case somebody um, criticises you for that. What's that, um, Pam? Sorry, just, just, just say that again, please, Pam. Um, in terms of uh, when you were speaking about 12.6, you said Equality Commission. Yeah. When you meant coalition, just for your thank own you. okay, thank accuracy. Yes. Yep, yep, thank you for that accuracy, Pam, certainly. <laughs> um, absolutely. And um, okay, uh, okay, so members are content with those actions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. AOB? Yeah. Sorry, I thought you were on the AOB. Not quite, not quite there yet, Jonathan. Getting there shortly. Um, uh, moving on then to, now to the Forward Work Programme, can I refer members to the draft Forward Work Programme at tab 13.1 of your pack? I can advise members that three academics have confirmed for next week's session on learning from international experience on fine test, trace, isolate and support. Professor Azim Majid of Imperial College, Professor Ralph Rentes from Hamburg University of Applied Science, and Professor Devi Schreeder from the University of Edinburgh. So I'm delighted. That's, that's, a, that's a very interesting panel, and I'm looking forward to that session. Um, so I'm just, that's for information. Separately, that then, are members content that we invite Trust Chief Executives on the 17th of December to update us on managing the pandemic? Given we're heading into this very difficult Christmas period, we know from experience that the first week of, or two of January are particularly difficult in terms of healthcare. So it will be an opportunity to, to discuss that with Trust Chief Executive if members are content. Yep. Thank you, members. Sure. And right. Yes, Jerry. Sure, I agree with that. Just a on forward work programme generally. Um, I don't know who the best person would be, but can we, can we, again, it's tight schedules and all that, but um, schedule in a, a briefing somehow, either written or, or another, uh, or verbal, um, on the Christmas sort of regulations, because there's going to be a lot of questions coming through uh, about sort of the, the new guidance around Christmas and the, the three, three house bubbles and all that. Um, so can we request either from the Department of the PHA we get a specific briefing of, uh, on that, if, if members agree? Yeah, members agreed to that. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Members agreed. So, um, so are members otherwise content then to note the forward work program? Yeah. Chair. Thank you. Yes, Pam. Sorry, just on the just on the forward work program as well. I'm just wondering, could we could we maybe get a, a briefing from um, from councils on the on the new powers that they have and in, in, in dealing with these um, improvement notices on premises? I think that would be good to have, if possible. Well, we'll need to take a look then at the forward work programme in terms of where that might be. If it could be considered, yeah. It, for, I, I know it's at, crowded, at a, but... Yeah, okay. okay. okay we'll, we'll take a look at that at where it may be, where it may be possible. You. Okay, thank you, Pam. Um, okay, members. So, members, therefore, content to note the forward work programme on that basis? Yes, thank you. And any other business then? Do members have any other business today? Yeah. Jonathan? Sure. Yes. The this committee has always taken up the cause of mental health and mental and physical well-being. We know that exercise is critical to the general health messaging. In fact, behind your head is the words prevention is better than cure and health in body and mind and spirit. But yet the Department of Health are about to bring into effect regulations which will see gyms closed from tomorrow. I have to say that I believe this is counterproductive in the extreme. You know, we'll hear the argument that you can exercise out, outdoors, but in Northern Ireland, with adverse weather conditions, with dark nights, in many regards, that's not possible. So I, I believe that this committee needs to take up this cause. Uh, we, we need a sustainable way forward for gyms to ensure uh, physical and mental well-being, and I think it would be negligent of this committee not to engage directly with the minister on this issue to see if we can find a sustainable solution to protect mental and physical well-being of the many gym users across Northern Ireland. Mr Chairman, I wonder if I could just correct Jonathan just that in fact it's not the Department of Health that is closing the gyms, that it's the Executive Office, so any uh, uh, correspondence uh, around it or any recommendations uh, would need to be directed to the uh, Executive Office. 
Well, first of all, they're both recurring issues. I will say, firstly, in relation to Jonathan, my view is that, that absolutely we, we should be exploring all of those things. We do have the Minister coming to our next meeting, and I think that will be an opportunity to raise that. In relation to Alan's point, these recommendations, once again, these recommendations are based upon advice coming from the Department of Health. That's my point. Our, our, job, our job, we are the Health Committee, Correct. and with all due respect, Alan, we, it is legitimate that we ask the Department of Health Thank in you. relation to those, exactly. to, those, to those answers. So we, we, will, we will, I think, continue to do that. I, um, I, can I just put in record, Mr Chairman, I think you're wrong there. I think that the regulations quite clearly are uh, presented, brought forward by the Executive Office. Uh, what you're saying is that uh, the evidence that is presented to the executive, we as a health committee uh, can query that. But if you're going to query an actual decision that is taken, the decision is taken, it's quite clearly taken by the executive office. By all means, yes, we can speak to the Department of Health and ask them what, uh, what advice they give to the executive. Maybe they give no advice to the executive about Jim. So, you know, we need we need to sort of find out the the, 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 the completeness of, of the uh, decision making process. And those are all, in my mind, valid questions for the Department of Health to allow them to explain that process. But my understanding is that, that the recommendations are brought forward by Health. The recommendations that have been approved have been largely um, agreed by Health. But uh, I, want, I want to continue to focus that, that our, our focus and our role in terms of scrutiny and advice is with the Department of Health. Thank you. Okay, members. I'm moving on then to time, date, and place of next meeting. Chair. I will. I will remind you that. Oh, sorry, Chair. Pam. Pam, you had an, no, before. I, before I bring you in, Pam, just to remind members that we're going into room 21 for our subsequent session on the care homes inquiry. Pam, really quickly, please, on your AOB. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm touching on what I see there because we're we're obviously looking at this, um, the COVID-19 and the care homes in our inquiry. But I've just, you know, I've been thinking around Don Sorry Care and, um, you know, wondering what testing provision is is being considered there. So I, I would like to ask if the committee would agree to write to the minister to ask if any testing um, or vaccination, including flu and COVID-19 vaccination, vaccination will be offered to uh, Don Sorry Care workers. Um, and also, as well as that, I would like uh, to know whether the department are looking at deaths of those who are in receipt of domiciliary care and whether that's being recorded because i think it is important to get a full picture um, amongst the most vulnerable in this pandemic of, of who's been affected and that so that we in order that we we do rapidly learn as much as possible about all the conditions that which the, our vulnerable people are are living in to make sure that they are getting the most protection they can going forward so um, that would be my request um if okay. the committee would agree Okay, I, I will. I will flag, I suppose, that again that we do have the minister coming next week, so there may be an opportunity for early answers around that. But in terms of completeness, if if your proposal, which I think it is, Pam, is that we ask for an update in in relation to testing and other other a uh, thing, other considerations within domiciliary care, that we ask for an update from the department about what's being planned in that in that sector. Are the committee content to do yes. that? Yes. Yes, and oh. to include the recording of of deaths in those settings as well. Okay, thank you. You content, sir? Can you just check? Is the member content that we notify the department that you wish an oral answer on that from the minister at the next meeting, rather than writing? No, or do you wish to write? That would be great. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you, members. So moving on then to any other business. Do member? Uh, sorry, we have dealt with any other business. And uh, uh, going moving then to date, time, and place of next meeting. So we're moving now to our further consideration of the care homes inquiry. I advise that our next meeting in public will be on Thursday, the 3rd of December, 2020, beginning at 8:45. That's an earlier start, members, to facilitate the minister's attendance at subsequent meetings. We're meeting here in the Senate chamber, uh, and we'll be briefed by the minister. And then, after our session, with we will have a session with international academics. Thank you, members, and good luck to you all in the time ahead. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the